So, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is where you are. We're here again on World War II TV for a discussion, a panel discussion about machine guns in the European Theatre of Operations, 1944 to 1945. And um, I'm going to bring it up to gallery view now and introduce my guests, or that rather they will introduce themselves. So, uh, I'll, I'm introducing them in the order I've known them because I've got to do it in some order. So, um, Richard, go first, introduce yourself and what's your background with machine guns? Yeah, so uh, Rich Fisher, I run the Vickers MG Collection Research Association here in Wiltshire in the UK. Um, been collecting Vickers now 25 years because my grandfather was a Vickers machine gunner with the 7th Battalion Cheshire Regiment, uh, Anzio, in the Second World War. Uh, he got me interested back in 1994 when we were visiting the Royal Marines Museum down in Portsmouth, sat down behind the Vickers, took it apart. I was mesmerised, age 12. Uh, 25 years on, I'm still mesmerized when I managed to do it first time every time. And uh, yeah, I've been collecting ever since. So obviously, you know, we were just saying we've known each other 20 years now since I joined First Airborne Recce as a living history group back in 2000, which sort of deviated and changed my mind to the Vickers K guns. Um, got interested in much wider stuff at the same time. Now it's almost full time. Uh, but I'm a research fellow at Cranfield University and Defence Academy as well, and a trustee of the Small Arms School course, Weapons Collection down in Warminster. Well, brilliant stuff. So we'll go to Brian now. So um, joining me, Brian from the USA. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Dimitrovich. And hold on here. Let me... There we go. I'm trying to get these uh, headphones set. Um, my interest in machine guns started uh, probably about. Uh, 10 to 12 years ago, and uh, I both belonged to a living history group, and a local gentleman took me out, and um, he uh, had a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, I uh, fired it and fell in love immediately, and it was one of the greatest days of my life, and, but it was probably one of the most terrifying days of my wife's life, uh, because I walked through the door and said I wanted to buy a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, so uh, it started at uh, Thompson submachine guns. Uh, and went to belt fed weapons, uh, mortars, and uh, now I'm into to, uh, light artillery. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> it is uh, started and is uh, transitioned uh, into these uh, bigger things, and um, that's uh, kind of where where my uh, passion has has been with these and, and just learning about them because I think uh, it's uh, you know not only do you have the stories of World War II, you have the stories of the men. Um, but you know, they use these tools and, uh, they're, they have their own history and, uh, how they use them in world war two, um, has, has really, uh, wanted me to, you know, learn as much as I can about them. And it's kind of turned into this, uh, weird hobby, uh, that, uh, I think at this stage, my wife wishes that I kept golf or took up golfing or something a little less, uh, zany. Right, and then finally, who I've a bit of a legend on Twitter, uh, <laughs> Nick. So, Nick, again, your your background with machine guns. Hi, everyone. Um, I kind of been interested in World War Two since I was a as, as a kid, and I think like Brian and and Richard, I've sort of progressed then into living history and reenacting with. Um, but my path went uh, alongside the bad guys um, of the time, and uh, I was a, a Wehrmacht. Um, living historian with 916 Grenadier Regiment of uh, World War II Living History Association, and then the Panzer Fusilier Regiment Gross Deutschland, that was a spin off of that. And through my experience with, with those reenactments, I became intimately acquainted with the MG42. Um, I was the designated Rickschutz, uh, the gunner, um, through many of the shows and was dubiously fortunate enough to, to, to carry it over a 10 mile slog on one, one occasion. So I'm very much an amateur uh, researcher. Um, I would say my, my interest in, in looking into the MG42 um, in, in far greater detail has only really um, happened over the last year to 18 months when I just happened uh, across more articles and books and documentaries 
that spoke about the MG42, but didn't speak about it in the way that I would have understood it. So hopefully I'm here today to put across my point of view with regards to how I believe the MG42 was actually used, um, both operationally and tactically. Well, brilliant. So I'll put it back on four screens so we can all talk and I'll, I'll big, put people on spotlight when they're showing some of the weapons they've got behind us and things like that and when they're talking. But the idea today is to bust a few myths, look at how machine gun tactics and deployment was developed uh, before World War II into Norm the Normandy campaign and, and through the campaign and just talk about the practical use, look at how we've acquired this data and... Um, yeah, and, I, and open it up to your questions. I'm going to keep an eye. That's why my eye is moving all the time. I'm keeping an eye on the feed and also the questions coming in because if anyone's got questions about machine guns or small arms in general, but we'll try and stick to machine guns. We may do a future show on other weapons, rifles, mortars. And um, don't forget on World War II TV, click subscribe and, uh, and you'll get notifications of our future shows. So we're going to talk now about... Um, to, to get things going about the development of machine guns after the First World War, before the Second World War, because um, this First World War gave both armies, the Allied armies and the, the Germans, ideas of how to use machine guns and therefore their development over the next 20 years. So before we get to the, the Normandy campaign, I think we need to discuss first um, what changes were made. So I think I'll bring in Rich first because um, a lot of work on the Vickers and the Vickers I think is the machine gun we think of when we think of the First World War. It is the, it is the, the famous one. Um, although some of those myths that Rich has spent time debunking the million rounds without changing the blah, 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 blah. But Rich, tell us about how the British approached machine gun use after the First World War and their thinking. And we're, by the way, folks, we're basing this on these three gentlemen's work, not just at looking at the weapons, but actually looking at the available archives and going back to documentation. There's lots of primary sources, and, and that's what Rich particularly has been using. So I'll put, the, put you on spotlight a bit, Rich, and just tell us about how the, um, the development progressed after the end of First World War. Yeah, no problems. So um, first thing we do at the, at, in those interwar periods is realise the army's way too big. And we've set up the machine gun corps in the First World War. So that consolidated all of the technical expertise, the training requirements, uh, the infrastructure in the organisation was all set up around the machine gun corps. We disband that. We get rid of it. 1922, the disbandment of the machine gun tour. Last things they, last things they do are... are um, some service in Ireland and then with the Anglo-Irish Treaty you know, they come home and disband and it, 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 it's one of, one of the reasons is that the army in those interwar periods doesn't need a centralised expertise around machine gun corps to go out and do what it does which is an imperial um, you know, service and you know, we, need, we need intrinsic uh, machine guns within battalions so the infantry battalions get their machine gun platoons uh, and one of the one of the great things that happens over the 20s and the 30s is the scaling up and, and down of how many machine guns are in that platoon and you know peak uh, time is actually we have a machine gun company with every every battalion so a three three rifle companies and a machine gun company in every infantry battalion around the world which gives it 12 guns to play with uh, and it's through that period that we're learning that the Vickers, uh, you know, albeit a 1908 design, is still capable of doing things in the 30s and with some tweaks. And the major tweak that we'll talk about because it peaks, um, that tweak peaks in 44 and 45, is development of 303 ammunition and the Mark 8 Z ammunition is developed, uh, streamline ammunition that allows it to fire out to 4,500 yards. Now, it's only the Vickers that uses that. Uh, the the mach medium machine gun role is consolidated. It becomes you know, a true capability. And we see the Lewis taking sort of traditional infantry light machine gun role. Uh, when that starts in the First World War, it's this light automatic rifle in the infantry battalions. But we see that light machine gun um, sort of uh, maturing in a way uh, in the 20s and 30s to provide that automatic firepower in the British infantry section and platoons. But we realised that the, 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 you know, the Lewis is fundamentally quite a heavy gun. Um, it's equally an older design. Bizarrely, the Vickers and the Lewis are trialled at exactly the same time in 1912, or adopt, uh, in 11 and 12. Um, 
So we see the Bren gun, and the Bren gun is the only real uh, technological development that the British have uh, during that period. But we do decide that we do want to replace the Vickers. And in, uh, as early as 1938, the Vickers is declared obsolescent, uh, planned uh, replacements. But the British Army spent so much on being mechanised, actually, it can't afford uh, to really speed up the, the experiments and trials for that. So you see machine guns drop again to um, a uh, sort of four guns per platoon. And then machine gun battalions formed. So unlike the machine gun corps in the First World War, you see uh, division, infantry machine gun battalions that then become divisional machine gun battalions, one per division, three companies of machine guns. And by 44, 45, we're looking at one company of machine guns, uh, sorry, three companies of machine guns and one company of 4.2 inch mortars, which then gives the infantry division in 44, 45, a fully mechanized, because each gun has a universal carrier to move it around. Um, and you know, so a fully mechanized, but lower number of medium machine guns in the infantry division. So that, you know, and, and that's tweaked uh, in the early years of the war with 1500 weight trucks before we get enough universal carriers. Um, and at one point there's 20 millimeter light anti-aircraft in that mix as well. So you get this divisional support battalion that can provide everything you know, heavy um, or, you know, or sustained firepower. Uh, but then you know, we, we go into 44, 45 with this divisional machine gun battalion of three companies of machine guns with um, with a, a company of 4.2 inch mortars as well. I think we'll touch on later on the fact that the, the, the Vickers within the British has the universal carrier to transport it. It means it's a, a much more mobile weapon and, and Nick and Brian can come on and disagree with me later on, but that ability to move it around to the battlefield with some kind of protection and um, and storage is, is key to how we deploy the the, the, the medium machine guns. We'll bring in the brand later on. We start talking about mm -hmm. um, squad and platoon tactics. But Brian, um, what was happening in the USA uh, in between the wars with regards to development of machine guns? So, so after well, during World War One, we're a little bit late to the show. Uh, so we're we are borrowing uh, uh, most uh, machine guns. Um, we do, however, uh, have a uh, a trick up our sleeve um, in the terms of uh, John Browning. And John Browning uh, is arguably uh, one of uh, the, the, the greatest uh, gun inventors uh, of, of all time um, anywhere in the world. And um, he, he has developed a, a belt-fed machine gun, uh, the Model 1917, as well as um, the Browning Automatic Rifle, or the BAR. And um, the BAR actually sees uh, uh, some action uh, in World War I. Um, it's... Uh, it's fielded, I believe, in September of 1918. Um, so war ends in November, so it doesn't see a lot of, uh, a lot of action. Um, but uh, the United States likes it. Um, it fires from a 20-round box magazine. Um, but at that time, the BAR roughly weighs about 16 pounds. And um, just like uh, no, no, D, no D goes unpunished, uh, the U.S. government says, hey, we want to make some changes to it. And uh, by doing so, um, they add a bipod to it. Uh, they add a, uh, um, a longer stock, a, a stock stabilizer, a handle, um, a, a, a beefier flash hider, and take this thing up over 20 pounds. And um, this is uh, going to be uh, a squad level uh, automatic rifle uh, that's going to go and, and be used uh, throughout the, the Second World War. Um, the, the, the Browning uh, belt fed, the 1917, um, is, is again at the tail end of World War I. Um, it's, it's, it's a water-cooled machine gun. It fires the same round as the BAR, it fires the 30-06 uh, uh, um, cartridge. And um, just like that, you know, at, at the end of World War I, they, they, they want to do some updates to it. Uh, they add a, uh, a reinforcing stirrup at the back end. Um, they, they do a few small tweaks to it. They parkerize it, whereas er the early on variants were blued. And um, that is uh, going to become uh, the heavy machine gun um, throughout the, and, and used throughout World War II. So there, there's a lot of things um, that, that are happening uh, with design and they want to make it better. Um, but, but when World War II breaks out, uh, you know, just like uh, Richard said, it kind of like halts everything and they got to go, okay, this is what we got right here. And, and this is what we're going to be using. Um, now in the meantime, you also have, uh, 
the, the 1919 here, uh, which is the air-cooled variant uh, of, of the Browning 1917, which is the water-cooled uh, variant that we were talking about. And um, the only difference really is, it, I mean, there's, there's minor differences, um, but, but it's, it's air-cooled. And um, so that is going to be the uh, light machine gun that is going to be used uh, throughout World War II for American forces. And the one thing that I want to point out that a lot of people think is, well, model 1919, this was made in 1919. Um, the early trials for that gun and the prototypes are started in and around that time, uh, but is not fully adopted by the, uh, by the United States Army until around 1935. Um, so, so that's when it comes into effect and it's starting to be issued uh, to, to the Marine Corps and to the Army. Um, so so they're, they're, they're similar. Um, obviously the weights are different. Um, the, the heavy machine gun here, um, you know, with, with the tripod and the gun, you're looking at close to 90 pounds. Uh, whereas with the, with the air cooled variant, 30 pounds for the gun and about 14 pounds for the tripod. Um, and then once, once we get into the discussion, we will, we'll talk about the different uh, uses of them, but that's kind of the development, uh, from, from, uh, at a high level, uh, obviously, I think we all could sit here for about, uh, uh, 10 hours each and talk about the, the, the development year by year of, uh, of what they were doing. Uh, uh, but uh, but that, that at a high level, um, we go into, it, for, for us, 1941, our, our squad weapon and our machine guns are the BAR, the 1919A4, and the 1917A1. And for, for those that are, that are out there in YouTube land, Yes, I know we did have the Johnson light machine gun, but that was utilized early on, and that was by the Marine Corps. We're, we're focusing on Europe here, just before anybody yeah, uh, yeah. freaked out over definitive statements. So we'll bring Nick in in a second, but I think um, already it's going to be the German side of things, I think is possibly the most mythologized compared to the Allied side of things, the MG42, MG34, and Nick has done lots of work into actually what was happening in Germany, and not just with the adoption of the machine guns, but also their use and their steering of tactics. And later on, we're going to discuss, do, do machine gun tactics, do machine gun development steer tactics, or do tactics steer and uh, machine gun development, and how does doctrine and tactics all come together? But Nick, I'll, I'll bring you in now, then, we, then tell us what's happening in Germany at the same time. So after the First World War, what was happening there with their machine guns? Because you've got some interesting stuff you were telling us a couple of days ago. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, well, essentially, the, the German experience from first, the First World War um, told them that they wanted to go in a very much different direction as to probably what we've understood here from, from Richard and Brian, which is Clearly, they've, uh, the, the Allies there have set out uh, two different machine guns, um, essentially a heavy and, and, a, and a light machine gun. But the German experience was that they specifically moved away from having both um, two machine guns to perform both roles, and they very much wanted to move to a, um, a, a general purpose machine gun, or in the case of the Germans, like the Einheitsmaschinengewehr, which is the universal machine gun. And that was the, the reasoning behind that was they didn't believe it was operationally efficient to have two different machine guns. They also, um, so from a production uh, perspective, it would reduce production if they had the one machine gun that undertook two roles. And that expanded into training as, as well. So uh, it, it, it streamlined training of, of, of their troops if they had or had the capability of producing a general purpose or universal machine gun. Um, the initial, Germany was initially looking at a universal machine gun in 1916. And so that's how, how, how far the thinking went back. Uh, and they started to revisit that probably in about the, from my recollection, the mid 1920s. Um, in addition to um, that, perspective from the Germans. They also had the restrictions of the Versailles Treaty, um, which prohibited them from um, supposedly owning and producing um, heavy machine guns. So that was another motivation for Germany to move towards one machine gun that could undertake both a heavy and a, and a light role. 
on that basis, we need, uh, if we look at a chap called um, uh, Otto um, Borowitz, who was a technical officer in the, um, in the, 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 the Waffenproof uh, Zwei, which was the infantry um, element of the inspection office for armament. And he had, um, he's been lent upon as, uh, with his post Second World War commentary on how the German thinking was at that, in that interwar period. And I'd just like to, to quote a, a summary of, of his views on the theory behind German, uh, German machine gun development. He said, that there is no question that the Heers of Offenamt desire the high cyclic rate of fire for their new weapons. The, the general purpose machine gun. Originally to make them more efficient against aircraft, but when the battlefield became more mobile, a higher rate of fire was also found desirable against ground targets. The theory was that since the target would only be visible for a certain amount of time, the hit probability could only increase if as many bullets were fired at it in the shortest possible time. So that has... That, that statement to me encapsulates the German point of view on its and motivation for how to develop its machine guns. They understand that warfare has developed into a far more uh, uh, mobile environment and we simply need to put 30 or 40 rounds onto a target very quickly. And if we can put that amount of bullets down there, we will probably or hopefully kill more people. That's essentially it. Hmm. And I would say that this, my interpretation of that is that this statement defined the subsequent infantry tactics of the German army of World War II and, and pre-war, um, of which Paul has alluded to that we'll, we'll, we'll speak about earlier. Um, so I think the... In addition to that, it's, uh, I probably need to convey that the two direct forerunners of the first true general purpose machine gun, the MG-34, were the S2-200, um, which was also designated the MG-30S. And that came into production in around 2829, um, but was actually in the end not applied um, within the Weisfeer because at that time they had the MG-13, but that was a, a direct forerunner of the MG-34. And then they progressed onto the MG-32, which was developed in MG-30, uh, in 1932. And they were both magazine fed, but did have some general purpose capability in that they were both um, anti-aircraft um, weapons as well as ground weapons. So that leaves us on those interwar years, ultimately with the MG-34 that was introduced to the German army for field trials in 1935, but um, only went officially into service just prior to World War II in 1939. So hopefully that wraps up a summary of where I see German, German thinking and motivation in those post post uh, First World War and interwar years. So to, to sum up, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, my experts, that we think the Germans particularly are actually developing machine guns in line with a, a, a change of tactical approach towards warfare in the future. Is it fair to say the British and Americans haven't quite got that far yet? They're just thinking about the weapons as their own right, or are they actually thinking about warfare changing? Uh, Rich, Rich, I'll put that to you first. Yeah, so um, it, it's interesting because the sort of Morovitz quote comes around the same sort of time when we increase the number of machine guns. So we can't necessarily do anything technically. So, you know, the Bren isn't a huge high rate of fire weapon. Um, you know, certainly the Lewis isn't and clearly the Vickers isn't. So, you know, we're not necessarily perhaps spraying too far from our steady musketry um, and marksmanship principles, whether deliberately or otherwise. But what we do do around that time is triple the number of machine guns that each infantry battalion has. So if we want to get the same number of rounds on target um, on this beaten zone area that you know, the, the, the Vickers creates, then the same outcome happens. Uh, you know, the anti-aircraft piece um, possibly linked to how we start to see the Lewis gun going into some of those roles and that anti-aircraft role. 
um, and greater numbers of those being equipped with tripods or anti-aircraft tripods, but not necessarily, um, you know, we're, we're not doing anything technically. The only thing that we've got in development um, at that sort of time that's an aircraft weapon is the likes of the Vickers K. Uh, yeah, with it, uh, with that high rate of fire. So, yeah, not on the ground. We're not looking technically, but we could possibly be solving the same problem uh, by our organisation. Because that's interesting, isn't it? In the, in the putting lots of rounds on the target, can I be achieved by either one weapon that does it very fast or multiple weapons that do it very slowly in principle? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think this is a good point, therefore, to bring in our, the, um, the thing we discussed in our, our pre-meeting of this is that, unfortunately, um, a lot of discussions about uh, machine guns on the internet and in books is what I call the top trumps comparisons, where they, they compare it based on nine criteria they read across and they say, okay, this weapon has this rate of fire that beats that weapon's rate of fire. This one is lighter than this one, therefore it's better. This one can fire further, whatever, quicker. For, and they just cross these things across and say, oh, therefore this machine gun is better than this machine gun. And it's rather like comparing um, you know, the, the Tiger tank and the Sherman. There are a lot less Tiger tanks than there are Sherman tanks, so it's an unequal way of looking at it. And I think we're going to try and get into the, the, the nitty gritty of that and, and, and explain not just machine gun versus machine gun, but machine guns with regards to their role within the greater doctrine of the armies they represent. So um, another thing we ought to address is a lot of hyperbole about machine guns comes from the recollections of, of veterans. And meeting veterans is fantastic. We all like meeting veterans and hearing what they have to say. And particularly from the Allied point of view, some of the German weapon, weaponry has received this, was attained this mythical status, the Hitler's buzzsaw, the, 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 the sound effect like ripping cloth, this, that, and the other. And that's all valid and interesting, but is it a fair way to, to analyze weapons use by just remembering that a veteran was particularly scared of something? I don't know. We'll go in. I think the more interesting way of looking at these weapons, which we hope we're going to get to in a minute when I stop rambling, is to actually look at the development of them, the paperwork, the doctrines, what the small arms manuals are saying, what they're advising in terms of their use, and getting away from this as I say, the top Trump's approach and the veterans' testimony approach. Um, and I'm just because I'm going to have to do it at some point. I'm going to read a quote and I'll ask Brian to maybe address this. So I was researching today on Google for quotes about machine guns. And this is the kind of thing that I found. And it, this is in a book uh, called After D Day Oper Operation Cobra and the Normandy Breakout by James J. Carafano. And he said, For squad firepower, US troops relied on the Browning automatic rifle, BAR, a weapon that was in essence an infantry heavy rifle. Like the MG42, the BAR was reliable and durable and even weighed four pounds less than the German machine gun. To increase their firepower, infantry squads usually found a way to get a second BAR and the practice became so common that the army eventually authorized each squad two weapons. Even with two BAR, BARs, however, the US infantry squad could not match the Germans' firepower since the MG42 had a greater effective range and twice the BAR's rate of fire. In fact, the MG42 alone could almost match the rate of five, every weapon in US infantry squad shooting at once. Um, kind of valid, but kind of also nonsense. I mean, you know, all at once, what does that mean? What does all at once mean? Would, why wouldn't my infantry squad be firing all? I, it, these are the kind of things that I just think, I don't know who, I don't know who this guy is particularly, just kind of, it sounds good, but I don't think it actually bears much examination um, because you have to look at the bigger picture of how weapons are deployed. But. Um, and there's lots of stuff and nonsense on the in internet about MG42s and Hitler's bus and all that kind of stuff, which we'll get to later on. So um, to bring it up to the topic, which is the, um, the the use of machine guns in Operation Overlord and beyond, we need to get from the, we've just discussed the development pre-war, we need to get from sort of 1939 up to 1944. So um, kind of briefly, we'll go around the house again. Um, what is changing with regards, I'll go to Nick first this time, so what's changing with regards to the German use, because it implies what you were saying earlier, Nick, is that this, this mobility aspect is very good at the early part of the war for the Germans when you're doing, and I don't like the word blitzkrieg, but I don't know what else to call it, the lightning war kind of aspect, but when you get to a more defensive campaign later on, um, maybe the same approach is not, is not the right one. So Nick, what's happening with machine gun? And, and obviously we know that the MG34 gets phased out by the 42 um, or, or, or superseded. But generally with regards to tactics, what's happening in Germany at, from between the beginning of the war and the period we're going to be talking about, which is 1944? Well, I would, I'll go back to, I suppose, you know, touch on where I was leading to on the previous comments, which is my opinion is 
the end, uh, you know, the nature of a high rate of fire general purpose machine gun has largely driven the German grouper or squad or section tactics. Um, they're all given one LMG, which was the MG34, and the German doctrine was undoubtedly that was the key weapon. That was the weapon that led the firefight. It was the weapon that was going to both suppress and kill, and it was to be protected and supported by the other nine men within that section. So 10 men in the section. The, it was viewed so importantly that the section leader, the Gruppenfuhrer, who would have been a court, typically a corporal, he would often take control of the three-man MG team solely because the weapon was that key that he, as the leader of those 10 men, that smallest tactical unit within the German army, he would be driving and leading that MG team. <coughs> Excuse me. Outside of that, when it's acting independently and the Gruppenfuhrer has decided to, 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 to assault a position with his remaining uh, six men plus himself, seven of them, he, uh, the, the, the Richtschutz, the, the guy in charge, the gunner in charge of the, um, of the MG34, he is often probably the, the second or third, uh, probably the third senior ranking soldier within that section. He would be typically um, a Gefreiter or Obergefreiter, and he would be of ideally above average intellect and uh, essentially a smart cookie, a reliable cookie, and someone who is also the marksman, specifically the marksman of the section. So here we have a lot of emphasis placed upon the importance of the German MG. We've got the section leader potentially leading the three-man team. In his absence, we have supposedly an above intellect German soldier who is also the leading marksman of the of the section so they're placing great emphasis and great importance on that weapon and the reason is it's because that's the weapon that is going to win the firefight and lead the firefight for the germans so if we spare that in mind and take 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 that in mind and we, um, we, we move on i would say that those tactics um were particularly adv advantageous and German tactics were probably designed more in mind of the offensive role rather than the defensive role as, as Paul suggests. And one of the key reasons that I come to that conclusion is that you had the German MG34 in the light role used at a section level but then you also had the MG34 used in the heavy role, the sustained fire role, which would be mimicking effectively the Vickers and or the Brownings. And they would be, it's certainly in the early to mid-war, they would be um, contained within a separate um, machine gun um, company, um, which would supp supply the heavy support to, to the German infantry battalion at that stage. Now, they would have been used extensively in those early war years, especially when the, the German army was on the offensive up until pretty much 1943. But what, you, what I found in my research is that, and this is coming through um, the, the German um, high command's chief machine gun officer, a chap called o, uh, he, uh, uh, Oberst Anton Butz, B-U-T-Z, is he reports in late, 19, late 1943, early 44, that the sustained fire role of the MG is not being used in the way that it was in previous years. And the, 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 the premise that he is making on that is that the light machine gun has become uh, the, the MG34, the MG42 that they would have moved on to, has become far more effective in a defensive role because they simply don't need a sustained fire role. It's not as, a, not that they definitely don't need it, but it's far less effective than it was in those early formative years um, where, where it was key for an offensive. So we've got a German 
I would say the one of the roles of the general purpose machine gun that, that, that Germany was were using certainly became far less prevalent in the, that sort of last 18 months of World War II because it appears they were forced on, onto the defensive and that removed the need for their sustained fire role. Right. So um, I don't know who we bring, uh, but let's bring in Brian now. So, because um, I read that quote about the BAR. So, um, what do you know about the BAR gunners and the Browning gunners? Are they the marksmen? Are they more intellectual? Are they more, what is there any evidence or is it just random guy gets assigned random weapon? <laughs> I, 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 I don't believe that uh, uh, American doctrine was, uh, you know, looking at uh, 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 standardized test scores or, or, or intellect uh, when it came to issuance of, uh, of rifles like the Germans uh, may have been. But I, it, at least for, for America at the start of the war, the, you, 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 you have to go back at, at least to around 1942 um, because you have similar doctrines between the Marine Corps and the Army. And the, the first test of that comes in 1942 on Guadalcanal. And after Guadalcanal, <clears throat> which is a, a six month campaign, um, but at the end of that, where both the Army and the Marine Corps fight on the island, uh, there is this study that's done um, on, on, the, on the use of tactics, fighting the enemy. And this is pretty much um, our test of our, our tactics and abilities, how we're utilizing BARs, how we're utilizing heavy machine guns, light machine guns. And um, these are then passed on uh, to the Army. Now, how you fight a jungle war uh, is not exactly how you're going to fight uh, a war in North Africa. Operation Torch uh, occurs uh, in November, late 1942. Um, so, so how you're approaching now uh, a different terrain, different enemies, are changing, and that's where you start seeing a little bit of deviation uh, of uh, of the um, of the doctrine in terms of the BAR. The I I don't recall ever seeing a use or a love of the BAR from the Army like the Marine Corps. Towards the very end of the war, the Marine Corps have three BAR men in a squad. That's how much they're utilizing that weapon. Um, I, you don't see that um, in, in the Army. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the United States Airborne really doesn't authorize the BAR in their table of organization until December of 1944. Now, I'm talking purely airborne, not glider. Glider troops are obviously using the BAR. Um, but the Airborne is really not authorized the, uh, uh, to use the BAR. Now, there are cases where um, paratroopers are, are using the BAR. Um, but I, I don't, um, you know, really uh, would recall them, you know, the, the love of it. All the research and everything that I've looked at, the Army was saying, hey, look, we have our, we have our three rifle squads, um, and within each squad, we, we have a BA Armin uh, and an assistant gunner and an ammo bearer. We're fine with that. Um, now, that's on paper. Now, you're, you're, you're going to see – things change in the field and, and, you know, we'll, we'll get into it when we talk about, you know, manuals and things like that, where you're starting to see the manuals guys are seeing in the field, Hey, they're using a gun like this. We never thought that they would use a Browning light machine gun like this. All right. We like it. Let's put it in the manual. Um, and, and it's in a matter of a year that they're doing these manual updates and you're seeing these manuals become thicker. If you, I, I don't know how it was on the German side uh, or the British side, but I know, if you look at a lot of early war manuals on the 1919, the 1917 A1, um, and, the, and the BAR, uh, the, the manuals are very, very thin. They're purely all text. Um, but by the end of the war, they've almost tripled in size. And um, they have a lot uh, uh, more diagrams, pictures uh, for, for the soldiers. And, and a lot of it comes and stems from lessons learned uh, in the field and, and how guys were utilizing it and the success that they were utilizing it in. So that's interesting that the, the Americans are actually learning in the field and adapting things. What's going on with the British? And I'm going to have to ask you to leave the Vickers aside for a second, Rich, and talk about the Bren gun. But you can bring the Vickers up whenever you like. I'm not going to stop you. But um, <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Bren and, the, and comparing it to the MG42, because I think 
you read in some books that yeah. the, the Bren is used in a similar way the MG42 where the rifleman are just carrying ammunition for the Bren. And I'm not sure whether that's really the right way of describing it or not. But if you could give us your kind of breakdown of how the Bren is used, I think it'll make a good comparison. Yeah, and I'm going to sort of link it back direct to Nick's you know, chat, really, because Excellent. it's a, um, you know, Nick talks about the, the section commander, um, I'll use British terms, but yes, yeah, the section commander being in charge of the MG42. You know, it's the section two I see in the British Army, second in command, that has the Bren gun uh, and, and two guys. So it's him, it's number one and the number two. And it's only really those guys that are carrying their sort of ready ammunition for, for the Bren. Other guys you know, are definitely carrying Bren mags and, and they are there to support, but they're not working in support of the Bren gun. Um, you know, you've got this classic fire and movement in it, uh, organization that still exists, you know, and existed, and I'm gonna mention the Vickers and I'll mention the Maxim even. It existed when battalions had Maxims back in the late 1890s. You, know, you had the, the Maxims holding fast while the battalion moved. If you imagine the same thing, you have the Bren gun holding fast while the section moves, then the Bren gun, then the section, you've got this, you know, the fire and movement as it exists. And that just scales up for the rest of the army. So, you know, the, the, or sorry, for the rest of the division. So if you imagine the Vickers in their battalions and the mortars, uh, the 4.2s, they're holding fast while the rest of the, the infantry, while the infantry move. Um, so, you know, the, the Bren gun has, a, has, does have a fundamentally different, um, approach to it. You know, it is for um, sort of accu you know, he hesitate to use the term sometimes accuracy because you know it, everybody says the Bren can you know fire ten rounds through the same hole at a billion yards or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and uh, yeah, that, that's it's accurate suppression. It's aim suppression. There'll be a technical term for it, but it's escaping me at the moment. Uh, rather than the MG42, which like Nick says, yeah, that, that dominates this section tactics. The Bren is to provide automatic firepower for a mechanized organization um, a, as an infantry battalion or a motorized organization, whatever. But it doesn't, you know, it isn't the, the, the central part of that. You know, our tactics still work on a you know, rifles alone basis um, if, if you, you replace the Bren with something else. What's really interesting about how our doctrine changes, uh, you know, coming to Brian's chat about manuals is great because what you see the, at the start of the uh, first world war, at the start of the second world war, um, the Bren manual is thicker than when it ends. It's the other direction. Um, <laughs> because the Bren at the start of the Second World War has its tripod, you know, one for every, uh, every other gun. It has its um, anti-aircraft role as well. And it's trying to do fixed line. And there's the, you know, the, the hen's, t you know, um, hen's teeth rare fixed line sight that collectors uh, you know, seek all the time. Um, it's trying to do lots of different things because that's what we thought it can do in the 30s. And actually, we just realized by you know, 1944, it just needs to provide some element of suppressive support for the rest of the section in the attack or you know, some, some element of defense. Um, you know, this rapidity of fire that, that Nick talks about for you know, getting round, lots of rounds on target quite quickly. Um, it does that. You know, it, it's quicker than a rifle. What you, know, how how fast are the enemy running that you need um, so many rounds down range so quickly? So, um, you know, the Bren's tactics almost just stabilize, and we focus on what a light machine gun can do rather than messing about with fixed lines and tripods and and uh, you know even even if you just look at the tech alone shows you that. You know, the Bren tri the Mark One Bren tripod has this anti-aircraft lever uh, leg that goes in it. Um, by the Mark II, that's gone away. So we're just going to look at some fixed line stuff. And and you know, it's the the numbers that are being um, you know issued just reduce as well. So in contrast to how the Americans are developing their tactics uh, for machine gunnery, uh, yeah, we're, we're sort of consolidating Bren gun usage. Um, you know, but, if you look at the Vickers, we sort of had that you know pretty well nailed um, at the end of the First World War. We know how to use the Vickers in most situations. Um, what we do end up doing though is you know, say mechanizing that, put moving that from its fifteen hundred weight trucks that are just moving it to the edge of the battlefield. You know, 
onto the universal carriers that are moving it onto the battlefield. So we're able to use it in a more offensive role if we need to. Mm. Um, we're actually able just to move it in a much more you know, a mobile role. So you know, bang the carriers on, um, you know, fire some stuff and get out again. Uh, you know, have everything prepared on maps. That, that's one of the things that map predictive fire, we, we combine with our mobility uh, you know, abilities um, and you know, do much more with it by the time that we're you know, rattling around Normandy in August and September 44 uh, to be able to um, you know, use those tactics that actually we've learned in the desert uh, you know, to get machine guns in one place fire lots of stuff very quickly, move them before the counter machine gun fire can happen or the mortars that are doing counter machine gun fire can happen and then um, you know, move those around again. Our tactics though, we're just applying something from perhaps our, um, you know, our, our bookcase full of different ideas that we've developed in the Great War uh, and put away for 20 years. You know, it, it, you know, we haven't been practicing lots of that until the late 30s uh, and, and seeing how that works. But it's worth you know, just re-emphasizing the fact that these are divisional machine gun battalions. These are not a machine gun company in every infantry battalion. And, um, you know, if one of the things that happens when we look at the more specialized battalions, um, no, just to finish that point. So, you know, the infantry battalions have got brand guns. That's their automatic fire capability. A machine gun battalion has Vickers guns that's its automatic fire capability never the two shall meet unless you're a super sexy different battalion um such as air landing battalions and i think one of the things that it gives me an opportunity just to talk about briefly is that um and because because we talked about it when, when we chatted uh, yesterday sixth air landing brigade uh suddenly dropped well <laughs> the irony of that um or the, uh, but they, they have vickers machine guns given to them in march 1944 so this is not something they've been planning to use. Uh, it's something that the parachute battalions have been using a little bit since 43, but the air landing brigade in 1944 suddenly go, your anti-aircraft platoons are now gonna be machine gun platoons, medium machine guns. So you need to go and learn machine guns. And they get a very, very brief you know, period of, of uh, like several weeks to go and learn machine guns. They can't learn all of the capabilities they need uh, so they don't learn indirect fire they learn direct fire so again we're restricting the capabilities of the weapon um, depending you know, to, to different battalions how they're going to use them so the, the, you know, the not everybody is as well trained as they could be some of that's learned um, over the next few months as they're using them and they do get dial sights and things like that so you know this this bit on the gun here and um, the dial sight that gives it that full range out to 4,500 yards those are being used by the divisional machine gun battalions, but not by the air landing battalions and sometimes not even by the parachute battalions who've had them. So our, 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 sort of, you know, our changes are actually much more restrictive in the army, in the British army, because you know, we realize the Bren is good at some stuff, not great at others. So let's not worry about the stuff it's not great at. And we realize that actually different units need to use the same technology, but for different reasons. Mm. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we're able to maximize on those, really. Well, I think well, one, something you said there, which is interesting, because you know, when you talk about the Bren manuals being thick at the beginning of the war and thin at the end of the war, that's Bren manuals at the beginning of the war, based for a regular army, in the army yeah. for many years, perhaps, and territorials have been the army for many years. Are we streamlining the use of weapons in the British Army? Because we are now, by 1944, using people who are civilians drafted into the army who are getting less training over, and also the training they've got to get. They've got to train for amphibious landings and things like that, and actually learning complicated weapon systems perhaps isn't as important as getting off landing craft and running up beaches, things like that. So maybe we're simplifying things um, because of the, the type of people we're getting through. And, and maybe that applies to the German Army as well, Nick. In the, in the 19... The, the things you're writing about in the 30s is a, re a regular army. What's the quality of recruits by 43, 44? So are they making things, are they adapting machine gun tactics for a poor quality of recruit or is everything carrying on? And, and I'll ask the same to Brian in a minute. Are things carrying on as if everybody's of the same quality they were a few years earlier? Yeah, that's, um, it's, that's, a, that's a good point, Paul, because um, again, if I refer back to... Um, Oberst Anton Butz, um, the I can't 
overemphasize the importance he has within the German army of World War II as the as the chief machine gun officer uh, of the Heer. And he was um, he he was in receipt eventually of numerous combat reports from from the front. Probably at that time in late '43, clearly it would have been Russian in Russia and Italy. That German machine guns, um, clearly 42s at that time, the MG42, were were failing, um, and the increasing number of these reports that were coming from the front and landing on presumably his desk somewhere in Berlin um, was was concerning um, uh, to the point whereby in I believe it was 28th of February 1944 um, German High Command issued a, a secret memorandum to um, all senior, pretty much all senior commanders, and it eventually filtered down to uh, platoon commanders that there were problems with malfunctioning MG42s, and the they had identified that it was down to um, a reduction in the quality of the recruits with regards to the maintenance of the weapon. Um, they seem to have identified it down to that, where the the German, traditionally the, you know, or historically the German training program for, if I may touch on this, this, this may give some context. The German basic training program involved the German soldier, the German infantryman being trained on the K-98. Once they were, had gone through the K-98 training, their standard rifle training, they all went on to training on the MG34 at the time, subsequently the MG42, and they had each had 21 lessons on the MG34 or the MG42, 21 lessons. But that wasn't without firing. They then went to the live firing stage and they determined after live firing who was the best marksman, who had good eyesight, who was muscular because they had to carry this damn thing around. And again, I touch on the point whereby they were not daft. They knew how to operate it independently in the absence of their section leader, the Gruppen, the Gruppenfuhrer. So once that had happened, those who were designed or chosen to go on to the heavy machine gun section, they received another 16 lessons. So a total potentially of 37 lessons. Now within those lessons, clearly a hell of a lot of, of emphasis was placed upon maintenance. The MG34, the MG44 required maintenance once a day, belts being cleaned, let alone the, the weapon being stripped and cleaned, belts needed to be lightly oiled, cleaned, made free of debris, because if that weapon failed, effectively, I would argue that the German Gruppe, the German section, the German squad, has effectively become almost ineffective if it loses its key weapon. Now, these reports were coming in, in say, in late 1943. They had interpreted that this was down to a lack of maintenance, of, of quality maintenance um, on those, on the MG42. So they put in place, following the letter of 28th of February 1944, a, an action plan to reduce the training program um, and focus more on the maintenance of the weapon for new recruits. And, but to correct the problems that were happening in the field, this letter that had gone down through, through divisional commanders, it ended up ultimately with, with platoon commanders who supposedly were tasked with going around personally and ensuring that each of their machine gunners had were, were capable and competent with regards to maintenance, um, that, that was put into place. In addition to that, the Waffenmeister, who, was, who would have been the, the, the regimental armourer, the divisional armourer, 
he was um, encouraged to circulate around his, his men on a semi-regular basis, giving tips and advice on how to maintain the weapon. If that weapon was not maintained, the German infantry would effectively fail, in my, in my view, to be effective in any way, shape or form. So it was critical that this drop off in poor quality, what, what appears to be poor quality recruits with regards to maintaining their weapons was addressed. And it seems that by the summer of 1944, this process had largely been rolled out across, um, across the, the German army and the training course had been uh, condensed and, and focused more on, 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 the, um, on the maintenance. But if, if I may just touch back very quickly on a point that Richard made with regards to his, uh, the, the British use of the Bren. And there's, I have my own theory why tactics were sub and the use of um, the American BAR and the British Bren was differential, differential from, from the MG34, MG42. And I think that's in part down to the, to the, the rifles of, of those three nations. Um, I believe that the MG34, the 42, their, their, their superiority in terms of firepower, the emphasis on them being the key weapon, I think put, my interpretation is it put a, a, a break on the development of and the rollout of the, the remaining German infantrymen's weapons. Let's remember that the German army for the majority of, uh, the German infantrymen for the majority of World War II were effectively using the K98, a five round internal magazine, long bolts action rifle, which had its origins in the 19th century. Um, now, if you compare that to the Lee Enfield and latterly the Garand, where you've got a sh pretty much sh short bolt action, uh, is it 10 round, 10 round rapid firing rifles? I think that's something that we can throw into the mix with regards to to certainly um, it influencing German rifle design, plus also it, it, it emphasizes differences between perhaps how a German, an American, and a, and a US infantryman would operate as a rifle. Thank I'm you. I'll Brian in a second, but I think that's a very interesting point. I think that Germans, in a sense, have put all their eggs in one basket. They've got for a general yeah. purpose machine gun, so they've, they've eliminated two weapons for one, and they're not as you say, developing their, in, their, their small arms, their rifles, so they put all their eggs in the MG34 and later the MG42, whereas we're going for a more um, a variety of weapons that do, that do jobs, more specific jobs well. Um, we haven't brought Brian in recently, so what's, what's happening, because we, we, we're going to bring it up to Operation Overlord and what's happening uh, with regards to that. What uh, lessons have been there. You mentioned the Guadalcanal and North Africa. So when the American army is going to be part of Operation Overlord, and not just those in the assault wave on the first day, but all the divisions coming ashore over the next few weeks, the 90th and the 83rd and the, all those guys, what have there been any significant changes to their use of machine guns in the last couple of years? Uh, you mean, you mean uh, the infantry divisions in Europe leading up to, to yeah. Overlord? What, what have we learned and what what what, what new techniques are there any new techniques being deployed for, for for normandy well yeah i mean you have guys out there that i mean i was just i was talking to a friend uh the other day about this where you know, we've been just hobbyists in terms of of using these weapons uh the 1919s the m1 garands the thompsons and, and we're just using them on the weekends. But over time, you know, you're, you're looking at saying, hey, I, we have a lot of, of experience of, say, 10, 15 years with these weapons. I said, do you imagine what these guys were doing, uh, you know, day in and day out? This is all they did. They became masters of their craft. So obviously, they're going to think of things that some second lieutenant uh, sitting at a desk with no combat experience that has, has been tasked, hey, I need you to write a manual on this machine gun. And, you know, he starts his typewriter and says, this is, this is what I'm going to start writing. Um, where in the field, you're going to start seeing guys utilizing these guns um, in a different manner. In terms of the doctrine, it really doesn't change uh, that much. It, nothing really changes drastically. It's more of, 
hey, we're using this in a new way. The Army analyzes it and says, hey, do we put this in the next revision of the manual? Um, you don't see uh, drastic changes uh, of divisions um, in, in the European theater. Um, they're, they're not really changing uh, their tactics at all. Again, they, they, we have our rifle company. Within that, we have our platoons. Within those platoons, we have our three rifle squads. Um, and then we also have our weapons platoon that has our, our machine guns in it and our BAR men um, in the rifle squads. So they're, they're, we're, we're just using it as is um, going forward uh, up until D-Day. One, one example, and I'll give this as, as an example, um, the, everybody starts realizing early on that, hey, this 1919, this light machine gun, because the BAR only has, 20 rounds. So it's a 20 round box magazine. It fires around, it has a, it has a slow automatic fire um, at around 350 rounds per minute. And then it also has a fast automatic fire at around 600 rounds a minute. So at a 20 round mag, if you squeeze that trigger down, you're talking two seconds. That's it. You're, you're, you've emptied that mag. And I think, uh, I, I don't know how it is in, in Europe, but uh, um, you know, here in America, you know, when, when guys take these things out to shoot, um, one of the things that, uh, when we, when we take these out to the range and, and I, I've had people from Europe come over and, and we've taken them to the range and when they do a mag dump of say a Thompson or a BAR, their, their face just kind of is just like, that's it. You know, this isn't, uh, this isn't combat. This isn't, uh, saving private Ryan where, where, where ammo is just endless and, and, and the gun runs for, for, for minutes upon end. We um, cages, Thompson, in wind tunnels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in, in where he goes there. That, that just, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. The, <laughs> the, um, so with the BAR, now all of a sudden you have this, this 1919. You got guys that are physically fit um, that, that have been using this weapon system for, for a long time. And they go, hey, look, I can actually – pick this up and actually fire it from the hip. And uh, I can almost fire it from the shoulder. And um, as a matter of fact, I believe there was a video going around Facebook not too long ago. Uh, I believe it was uh, uh, in the Pacific somewhere. I think it was on Bougainville. And it was uh, men using, I think it was water cooled actually. And they were firing uh, above their head. They were firing from their hip. Um, and that was, that was going around. I know I got it sent to me about 600 times uh, by people. And, um, but, uh, so guys are actually using this and saying, Hey, look, if I, a old, uh, 30 cal belt, wrap it around, uh, I'm going to stand up here. So if I take, if I take a belt and I put it here and I take it back here and I swing this around me, um, now all of a sudden I could take, say a cut down belt, say, instead of having a 250 round belt, I only use say a hundred round belt. Uh, but now I have I've effectively taken the fire capability of a BAR and, and now can throw down uh, rounds downrange. That's, that's not in the manuals in, in 1942, 1941 uh, for the 1919. By 1943, 1944, that is now demonstrated in the manual because they say, hey, look, this is effective enough. And, and if you go back and look uh, on critical paths, I know, I believe in Aachen, uh, there's a few film reels of guys walking down the street uh, with the, uh, firing the 1919 uh, uh, in, that, in that manner. So um, again, this is a way that, that we're kind of adapting and kind of going back to the manuals where somebody in the army or the ordinance department is going, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, uh, let's, let's utilize it because guys are, guys are doing it. Mm. Um, and uh, I believe I believe also Arnold Schwarzenegger used that uh, variation on the uh, Terminator Three uh, when uh, <laughs> yeah, he yeah. he comes out with it. So obviously he was using the later war manual. Uh, yeah, he wasn't so using the. Also, he did a lot of reading of manuals before taking that. <laughs> um, I think it, something you mentioned there, Brown, is really pertinent in that you were you were talking about the fact that your guy, American guys, had a chance to fire, and I'm going to use the word shitloads of rounds before they went into combat. 
the Germans, I guess, also use it because they're continually at war. And there's no real break for the German army from 39. They're, they're, they are training men, of course, but they're on fighting on all fronts. The British army, which is interesting, by contrast, you take our forces in Normandy, a very few percentage have seen any combat for at least a year or two a day, and some not for four years. Third division, I mean, I've not done anything since Dunkirk, and I think about my great uncle in the Royal Oster Rifles, who told me that he'd put about five rounds down the range in as many months before D-Day, because there just wasn't enough ammo to give people thousands and thousands of rounds to go out there and practice. So is it fair to say we British are using a lot more in terms of manuals and other people have done the work for us and then they're putting it in manuals for us to use the manuals because we just haven't got the ammunition to get really familiar with things. I mean, I think about even doing these, these shows. The more I do, the better I'm going to get at it, theoretically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I can only think about the British 3rd Div and the, 50, uh, the, the 49th Division and the, uh, I mean, the 50th Division, yeah, they've been out in Sicily and Italy, but most of our units, they have been training for years with with so how, how many do you know which how much ammunition a British division would be using in training how much would they be allocated just to practice do we have any idea about that not off the top of my head not not sort of just flicking through some notes there because i've just got some stuff of the sixth air landing um training scheme and it doesn't it doesn't sort of give numbers um but it does talk about uh yeah just bring it back to Nick Nick's sort of conversation of number of lessons really quickly um, while it's in my head. There's 120 lessons just to train guys over four weeks in direct fire, and they're not um, and they're not really uh, looking at you know, firing that other than um, in some classification shoots. But having just you know made my brain work for a few minutes, done the politician thing of talking about something else while I think of a thing. Um, it is because I've costed it up to see how much it is to reproduce those manuals on YouTube, um, and all the lessons at some point, and it, they get about 1,750 rounds per person, which is quite you know, a big amount on the Vickers. Um, I can't comment on the Bren at the moment, um, but certainly for the Vickers, yeah, they're, they're getting 1,750 rounds roughly per person that's going through medium machine gun training, just in the number of classification shoots they've got to do, the demonstrations that happen, the platoon level uh, training, the company level training, and the divisional level, uh, and then the, the battalion level training. But that's by the book. I don't know how that's changing. Um, I'm guessing that those uh, 21st Army Group units that have been in the UK and have gone through the machine gun training centres are going through those, uh, man you're know, going through every lesson by the book. There's nothing that I've seen that indicates otherwise. Um, there'll be acute ammunition shortages at different times. Uh, and coming back to what I said about the interwar development, the fact that Vickers uses Mark 8Z rather than Mark 7, uh, 303 ammunition means that if there's a problem or a requirement for Mark 8Z somewhere else, you know, they might have to um, change those barrels over to Mark 7. It can use Mark 7, but you can't mix and match. So, you know, there may be a reduction in how they're doing it. But yeah, they're getting nearly 2,000 rounds per person uh, over the course of their training. It's, it sounds a lot, but it doesn't sound a lot. I mean, I don't know. I mean, what, what do we have about the German side of Nick? Do we know how, ma how many rounds they're going to practice? I mean, or is it all being kind of done in the field? Or a lot of it being done actually for practice for real? Yeah, as when Richard brought that up, it was I'm just being, I was um, racking my brains and was going to, I'm pleased to got the opportunity to interject because, as I say, say from... Certainly, uh, through the, the the early war years up until about 1943, there were definitively 21 light machine gun lessons undertaken by each um, infantryman, um, and then they went on to live firing, and that's when they determined the best marksman. My recollection from my reading is they had very few rounds, live rounds allocated to each individual they were literally using blank ammunition for all the other training up until up until the live firing and i i will be able to, i'll come back and confirm this so and if we can perhaps put it out you can perhaps put it out on one of your later youtube shows mm. for people who are interested but i don't think it was anything more than 100 rounds per person wow okay wow that that that's that, quite that's, different yeah that's amazing isn't it um um, I'm conscious of the fact we've been at this nearly an hour and 10 minutes now, and we, we're only 
halfway through my list, although we have come tackled some of the stuff further down the list. I knew this was going to happen. I'm not worried about it as such, but um, I feel we ought to get some, 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 some juicy stuff and come back to some of the geeky <laughs> stuff later on. Just because I don't know whether anyone's committed suicide watching yet, but I don't know if there's lemming Sunday when all these YouTube watchers start jumping off cliffs because, no, I'm enjoying it. But um, so we're going into Normandy. So we, the, I, I like Nick's points about the fact the Germans have seen that there's a, there's a maintenance issue, it's maintenance issue and, and have seemed to address it. We've simplified the use of the Bren gun in the British Army and we seem, we've got our machine gun uh, battalion uh, companies ready for our use with the divisions. Americans just going in with with lots of practice, so they've they've had lots of chance, and they are adapting. I like the idea of the using the Browning from the hip there with the cut down belts. That's really interesting. But let's bring it. Um, we will later on people watching. We'll we'll do the biggest myths about each people's respective nations' weapons. So Nick, I know is busting to do the myths of the MG42 and Rich the Bren and the Vic, um, the the BAR and the Browning. But I think. Let's talk about Normandy, which is the Sabbath, well, the ETO, and say, once we've hit the beaches on June the 6th, what immediate changes, if any, are, are happening with machine gun tactics? What are we learning, all of our sides, as we actually face combat? Is there any, what, what, is there any evidence to show that things are changing within, within the manuals, or is it all what we have coming from veterans' testimony? I'll bring, it to, I'll bring Brian in first this time. What do we know? What is happening in a Normandy campaign? Brian, hello. So, for at least in, in the Normandy campaign, it, yep, you there? Yep, yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we got it. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, there we go. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's coming up saying my internet connection is unstable. So, um, so w w what's happening in the Normandy campaign is uh, you, you got at least from an American side, you got to look at it on. on on two, two fronts. One, your regular infantry, and then also the airborne that are using um, the, the Browning and the BAR, the 30 cal machine gun and the BAR uh, in semi different roles. Um, when say the 29th, the 4th ID, they come ashore on D, um, they have uh, their, their, their rifle squads, they have their, their, their weapon platoon, and then that's, that has their light machine guns in it. So the Brownings are contained at the rifle squad and, and the machine guns are, are within the weapons platoons. Um, and then what's happening is, is that these squad leaders and the platoon leaders of the rifle squads are, are now, they have observers, they're radioing in saying, hey, we need machine gun support, uh, whether they be in attack or a defense position. Now, on the flip side of that, the airborne on D-Day and and in subsequent days after that, they're they're jumping in with two rifle squads so their platoon is two rifle squads one mortar squad now instead of having a bar integrated in with the rifle squads they've chose to use the, the 1994 uh in, in that in that in that role um so and and the idea behind this is um and this is kind of early on this isn't is specific for normandy but the whole idea, the concept behind it was, hey, if we put all of our light machine guns in a, in a weapons platoon and that weapons platoon gets on a C-47 and, and that plane gets shot down, we don't have any 1919s. We don't have any light machine gun support. Um, so, and then also they're thinking of, hey, look, that BAR is only giving us 20 rounds in a box magazine where now we can have a 250 round belt that's doing pretty much a, a similar um, um, thing as, as the BAR. Now, again, it's not as ergonomically set up where a BAR is a, is a rifle where you can shoulder the 1919, you're able to, you know, um, at, at least maneuver somewhat, but you can't shoulder it. Now, later on, um, now in 1943, the Ordnance Department authorizes the 1919A6, uh, which is a 1919A4, with a little bit shorter barrel, they add a bipod to it and a shoulder stock. And what they're trying to do is emulate the MG42, the MG34. Uh, so they're trying to learn from the Germans. Um, but when, when this thing is actually used later in 1944, um, from, from who I've talked to, uh, veterans, uh, at least air, airborne veterans, 
Um, they really didn't like it because if you're in a fixed position and you're using that 1919, you can actually traverse it on the tripod here. Whereas the 1919A6, you have to reposition, the shooter has to reposition their body uh, with it and you don't have that uh, maneuvering capability. Um, so guys are essentially taking off a lot of that, putting it on a tripod um, and utilizing that. So, so you have two different doctrines um, within the United States Army uh, on D-Day that are using um, that. Now, going back to, to Nick, you know, talked about the, the German doctrine at the time. And at a high level, when I do talks, usually I get a question about, hey, what's the difference between the German and the United States approach on machine guns? And, and at a 30,000 foot level, I, I always say, we wanted the machine gun as a support role. Uh, it was never meant to be the focal point of the attack. The riflemen were the focal point of the attack where the machine gun supported the riflemen. Whereas the German uh, doctrine was, the machine gun was that focal point and everybody was kind of supporting that m machine gun. Um, now again, it's a, at a very, very uh, a high level, but we, we never really, uh, our doctrine at the time really wasn't, hey, let's get a 1919 crew out front and, and have them start you know, leading the way. Uh, um, and, and then everybody's kind of supporting that 1919 or that Browning. Um, the, the, the Browning, uh, the BAR, for instance, they, you know, using Normandy as an example, um, the idea is, is that you have your rifle squad and say your, your rifle squad is, is, is moving through the hedgerows and um, you have scouts, and, and these scouts are at the head uh, of, of this squad, and they're going to, they're looking for the enemy. Um, nine chances out of 10, the enemy finds them uh, before they, they see uh, the Germans. Um, so the Germans, you know, start, start shooting, uh, usually maybe with an MG42. Um, they open fire on that, on that calm. Now, the, the American rifle squad, those three squads are working in unison, so you have this this base of fire squad, you have a maneuvering squad and a security squad. So these three are trying to, to do this dance uh, together. Now, in order to get into your dancing positions, you, you can't do this under fire, especially if you have a couple MG42s firing at you. So the idea is, is that the BAR is going to start shooting um, and, and laying down that automatic fire um, onto those German positions or where they think the German positions are to allow those squads to start getting um, into their positions, allow those riflemen to come up with the M1 Garand and start laying down fire. And, and then that maneuvering squad could start trying to find the flank of that position. Um, so, so that is pretty much the doctrine um, that, is, that is being utilized by the Americans. And then you're going to start bringing up the 1919s um, in, in more of a support role to, to put even more firepower uh, down on a uh, on the German positions, and that makes sense because a BAR also. I'm thinking in, the, in the, from a German behind a hedgerow, it's not that easy to to pick out a BAR gunner, but it is very easy to pick out a crew running along with a, a Browning, isn't it? Um, so a BAR, I mean, it's a big rifle, isn't it? So at distance, you can you can sort of whack out some automatic fire without oh, oh and the Germans oh that's an automatic weapon there. We didn't see that at that distance. That makes sense. Um, that the, the, the BAR has been used in that moving forward role. Um, so I'm not sure to bring in Nick or, or Richard. Yeah, well, well, and also, well, oh, just, real, just real quick, you know, also too, the one thing where the BAR, your BAR man, he's, he, he's got a mag in, he's ready to fire. Whereas the, the 1919, if you're looking at by the manuals early on, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, you, you have your ammo bearers that have the, 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 the ammo. You have your assistant gunners, your main machine gunners. So, you know, the guy takes the tripod, sets it down, rolls out of the way. The next guy sets the gun down, opens up the top cover, feeds the belt in, shuts it, racks it, and he's ready to go. That takes time. Um, the BAR gunner, he's walking. They see contact. They can immediately throw that thing up and start putting down automatic fire. Now, as, as the campaign progresses and these guys start getting experience, when they pick that gun up, they're, they're leaving that belt almost in it. If the belt's kind of uh, uh, already used, say there's 50 rounds on it, they're slinging that belt up 
and then they're they're carrying it and they're getting ready so that they're going to save they're saving precious seconds so that they can set that 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 30 cal down and start putting rounds down range so again you're, you're kind of deviating from the manual a little bit but the reason the bar was wrong was because it was ready to fire uh, at a moment's notice you flick that safety off and, and, and you're putting rounds down range so brilliant. I think we'll bring in Rich now because what's what's British when we're in? I know you can talk about Brent and Vickers as you want. I'll let you. I'll let you talk about what you want. But um, what as our how as our practical experience in the Normandy campaign, influencing things within the British Army? Yeah. So there's sort of two two points really here because the well, it's three because I'm going to bring the K guns in as well. Oh, the K guns. Um, of it, 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 it's like my most popular video on YouTube. So everybody loves K guns. Um, but the, the the first one, Vickers. How we go ashore with the Vickers is we break them up and we give them to individual battalions, um, you know, sections. But we quite you know, to make sure they get ashore. Perhaps you're know, following on Brian's point about putting all your machine guns in in one plane um, for airborne guys. Yeah, you know, the same happens with landing craft. So we break up the the machine gun uh, battalions into supporting individual uh, battalions and companies. But then when as soon as we get ashore. We consolidate those again because we know they're best effective uh, when they're working together in numbers. Bren guns, almost sort of uh, the opposite, is that we um, put those Brens in, you know, in their groups. But later on in the campaign, there are certain battalions, and I don't know whether it's widespread, but there are certain, and there are certain battalions that are grouping those together at a platoon level to provide this greater base of fire that they can work with. So perhaps you know, each of the Bren guns across the sections or um, getting the anti-aircraft platoons out of the infantry battalions with their Bren guns and supporting you know, section attacks in that way to try and you know, consolidate that fixed uh, fire element of fire and movement. Um, but one thing that we do on Overlord for the first time, and we later repeat at Volcaran uh, and, and Vessel, is use the Vickers gas operated, so the Vickers Ks. Um, and these are aircraft guns, and these are here mounted on one of their um, the Jeep mounts. It's the special air service we use in them, hence why they have this you know, mythical, wondrous thing um, that surrounds them. But as, uh, you know, as you know, Woody, you know, the, the, the Army commandos use these as a ground assault um, gun. You know, because you watched me carry one from you know Khan, uh, from Khan Wister on ferry to Pegasus Bridge. And I was sort of awful within the first, I don't know, kilometre. Um, it was a very fat-faced boat with me, age 19, looking a lot sweatier than I do now. Um, but they stuck bipods on these. Uh, they stuck, uh, you know, uh, shoulder stocks and, and grips, converted them from Royal Air Force uh, ground defense, airfield defense company guns, actually, you know, that were already using them in a the ground roll because they're an air gun. But they provide that 950,000 round-ish uh, rate of fire. They provide that suppression, which changes the Army Commando tactics. So number four and number 10 inter-allied, uh, yeah, the French French sections there were having to basically equip the rest of the section with K mag pouches. You know, and these 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 big drum ones here that you see on on the mannequin. Um, not Lewis, not Thompson. K mags, you know, really big, wide straps because each one of these holds a hundred rounds and cuts into your neck and gives you blood blisters on your shoulders that you still have twenty years later. Um, but they yeah they, they did carry this stuff in but they had to arrange the section around that because of its ammunition consumption so that's a that's sort of like assault firepower we, you know it's the it's the medium machine gun guys of the heavy weapons troop basically put down the vickers or some sections of those put down the, their medium machine guns take up the gas operated vickers and use that for the assaults they soon realize that basically once they've gone through their, you know, I think it's about 20 mags, so 2,000 rounds that they take in with every gun. So you can each guy can hold two of these. So you need ten or well, nine to support one machine gun. Um, they soon realize we can't sustain that kind of consumption. So bin it off, put those heavy weapons troop guys back into the heavy weapons troop and do the proper machine gunnery stuff with the vickers in direct and uh, sorry direct and indirect fire uh, on that eastern flank on the orn so it's you know we do do something special for overlord with our machine guns that we don't repeat or, or we don't have as a constant but we do repeat it for our big assaults again mm. at volcaran and vessel so that's quite different 
Um, I'm yeah. also coming back, sorry to interrupt, I'm also coming right. back to Nick said earlier, because I think we ought to sort of start drawing some sort of conclusions as well during this conversation, yeah. so we can actually pretend there's actually some worthiness behind what we're doing. And it's Nick's comment uh, right at the beginning about this idea written in the, was it the 20s, written about putting lots of fire down on a target very quick because it's mobile. It seems to me that both the British and the Ger Americans are also doing this, but via a very different method. The, the BAR method in the hedgerows is to put down lots of rounds on a target very, very quickly. And the Vickers K gun is to put down yep. lots of fire on a target very quickly. So it's almost as if we are going for exactly the same result as the Germans, but by a different, completely different method. As if the Germans have kind of, are onto something earlier, but we're finding a different way of getting the same result. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you can yeah, argue with that, really. That's what I'm kind of coming to conclusion now. And it does make sense in that, you know, we could go off on a tangent, but the German weaponry systems did have huge influence beyond the war, the M60 evolving out of the yeah. MG42, infantry tactics, blah, 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 the MP44, AK-47, all that kind of stuff there. There's a lot more influence the German army gave to the modern weapon than perhaps the British and the American, but on basic, a basic terms, I'm sure you can find other examples that, 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 that discount, but in, in basic principle, the German army kind of pushed things and, and down a direction, it's almost still going. Um, uh, so we've covered the change of tactics a little bit in Normandy, but we're not, we're, we're not reinventing the wheel, we're refining more than changing, I think, aren't we? Um, so Nick, I haven't brought you in a bit for a while. Um, as the Germans are, are, are frankly losing the Battle of Normandy, what, what um, efforts are they making to, to, to try and do anything with machine gun tactics to sort of stem the tide, or are they just carrying on the same, same method as before? Um, genuinely, I, I've not come across any any accounts um, that would suggest that the Germans materially changed their their, their use of their you know light machine guns at that stage, the MG forty two. Um, I think they were probably perfectly well suited for the defensive warfare that um, Germany was actually fighting at that time. Um, I think, you know, many of us are probably aware of in the the, the, the archetypal Bacage situation with how it, you would set up an MG 42 in one corner of the field and be able to be, be able to cover the, in, the the entirety of the field with, with just what one one weapon. Um, but I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any material changes to the the essential doctrine of of the um, of the MG uh, of the German use of the LMG. I, sp I think what, a couple of points that are worth noting is that there was one LMG within the infantry um, grouper uh, the section, but we mustn't forget that with the Panzer Grenadiers. Um, Panzer Grenadiers that were supporting the Panzer Grenadier divisions and the and the Panzer divisions, that their equivalent Panzer Grenadier Gripper were equipped with two LNGs. So the likes of Panzer Lair and all the SS divisions, etc. Um, second Second Panzer, you would expect to see each of their Panzer Grenadier sections being equipped with two. Um, MG 42s. And so I, I guess that that again emphasizes sheer weight of firepower um, and the fact that um, of those 10 men in that, in that platoon, that just left six six riflemen, including the, the, the section leader, again, one would think with, with K98. So we need to bear in mind they would, they, you know, those Allied troops that were facing. Um, Panzer Grenadier um, equipped divisions were were doubling up on their MG42s, and I think it's also important to to emphasise to the people listening that a part of the mythology, my interpretation of the mythology of the MG42, is that of of the of Omaha Beach, and I suppose um, the the opening scenes in uh, made famous by Saving Private Ryan. In that, our interp I believe a key interpretation from many people towards the German defenders on that beach was that they were all, you know, every, every 
machine gun there was an MG42. When we discussed it a little bit on, on Twitter recently and um, guys like Sean Claxton have come in and, and added and, and two or three others um, whose names escape me at the moment, so apologies there. But I think we're identifying more and more that the MG42 was by far the, 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 the most, the, the rarest machine gun on Omaha Beach, given yeah, what we understand. Sean yeah, and I think was my other guides there as well. Um, yeah, yeah. In, just in terms of the use of other, you know, captured French, Czech, Polish weapons, and the fact that the MG42 at that stage would only be issued to f frontline divisions, which what one would anticipate was only um, allocated to the 352nd Infantry Division who were defending in part Omaha Beach. So I think it's important that perhaps people start considering the fact that actually very probably certainly the, the minority of guns on that beach was the MG42. But mm. um, yeah, I hope, well, hopefully that's of interest. We, we've been 90 minutes now. So, um, you know, we, we were talking jokingly those watching before this, as Rich said, how long can you keep these things going? And I said, well, <laughs> YouTube stops archiving after about 12 hours. So technically we could keep on going. But um, I think for those, you know, watching, we should start to kind of think about getting towards it. I think we should go around now and talk about the myths. So rather than one person talking for a length of it, we'll go around and each do a myth about their respective nation's weapons one at a time, just to kind of do it like a, a different round on QI. I'm, I'm Stephen Fry now, or Sandy Toxvig, and we'll go around and do some. So let's, um, I know you're, about, you're jumping to go in, Nick, that's why I'm not gonna to go to you now. Brian, when you're doing your talks about machine guns, so one myth at a time, blow, blow a myth about American machine guns out. What, what do people think they know that is actually incorrect? Uh, I think it would have to actually associate with the 1917 A1, the water-cooled machine gun. Um, many times uh, when I uh, talk about it or I bring it out, um, usually everybody associates it with early war. Early war, this is an early war gun, and that somewhere down the line, uh, it is replaced by the 1919 A4. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is kind of personified uh, through film. Um, you know, if you, if you watch uh, HBO's The Pacific, um, the, 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 the Guadalcanal episode uh, is heavy on the, on the water cools, on the 1917A1s, and you never see them again throughout the, uh, throughout the series. Um, as a matter of fact, John Bazalone later on Iwo Jima now has a 1919A4. So it kind of puts this... Uh, idea in somebody's mind that, well, well, yeah, this is a, a heavier gun. Uh, and we went to this semi lighter, uh, gun. And, um, so, and then also, also, you know, saving private Ryan, band of brothers, a lot of, a lot of these, uh, uh, uh shows and, and movies, um, don't really, uh, portray, portray this re weapon. Um, but as a matter of fact, um, the, the 1917 a one, uh, was 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 it was it Pearl Harbor? Uh, it was it was in Corregidor. Uh, it was on Wake Island, Guadalcanal, uh, Torch, Normandy. As a matter of fact, the, the water cool machine gun uh, was used heavily uh, in Normandy. Uh, those those typically were brought in uh, at least in an airborne side. Uh, was uh, uh, utilized by the glider. So so even the airborne troops uh, were using water cooled machine guns. Um, they uh, uh, and they were used all the way through Europe uh, until the end of the war. As a matter of fact, we were still producing water-cooled machine guns. Uh, Rock Island uh, had actually started uh, a program uh, to start manufacturing new water-cooled machine guns. Uh, but instead of having a brass trunnion and a, and a brass end cap, uh, they, were, they were all steel and um, be, to, to, to fill the need for the, for the heavy machine gun. And um, it was uh, uh, utilized all throughout the war in Europe, and, and it was there at Okinawa. And as a matter of fact, it was used all the way up until the Korean War um, in, in a heavy use. So um, that, I think, to me, is, is one of the biggest things when, when people, uh, they, they, they see it. I just, you know, I always want to show some love to the, to the old school uh, design because people see it and, and they, uh, they, they think that, oh, well, we, we didn't utilize that. But as a matter of fact, um, you know, I actually, I got some, some props to show you. So this here 
is a barrel from a 1917A1. And this is a barrel from a 1919A4. And as you can see, uh, definitely um, the thickness, this here uh, is about three pounds. Uh, this about doubles it. Uh, it's close to almost seven pounds, this barrel. And the idea is, is that this is, uh, uh, this is in water. So it's in this water jacket. So it can have a, a sustained rate of fire uh, uh, because it's being cooled by the water. Um, in, in order to, to go to the air-cooled capability, um, they had to um, dispel the heat. Um, so they had to make these barrels a lot thicker. Um, but, but again, uh, if you wanted to, to have a, a, a highly secure defensive position, uh, the 1917A1 was, was used uh, th throughout the war. Um, now, towards the end, guys are like, hey, look, we're, we're pumping these 1919s out like they're gumballs. Um, so, so there really wasn't an, an issue of, of sort, shortages of machine guns. So if they were burning machine guns up, uh, I mean, you just you, you, you got another one. Um, there was really none, but, but the 1917, that's, that's kind of the, I think the biggest myth, uh, at least that I, that, that I've experienced, uh, that, that I see almost on a, on a yearly basis when I, when I do, uh, firing demonstrations or talks. Oh, good. That's, that's myth number one. Now, I think we have another vote who likes water-cooled weapons. I wonder who might, that might, might, that might be. So, Rich, your number one myth about machine guns, be it Vickers or Bren or the K, whatever you want to do, I'll hand over to you for a second. I think the um, you know, Brian's talked about you know, the myth of water cooled guns not being in the Second World War, which is something that I, we do get. You know, it's a, they're World War One design, but the one behind me is a Second World War production gun. It was made in forty three. Um, the, the the myth really is about usage, though. Is everybody expects somebody to be sat behind a machine gun looking out at the target, you know, direct fire. Um, and yes, that happens, but it happens at 2,000 yards. You know, it, nobody needs to worry about the target that they're hitting, really, um, because they're hitting it at a beaten zone that's 100 yards long and 20 yards wide at that point. And you've probably got four guns firing on the same target as well. And the, the, you know, the benefit of the dial sight here is actually you can reach out to 4,500 yards from that. You know, what's that? 2.7 miles, something like that. Um, and so this this myth of machine gunnery in general of of people of it being in the front line or um, just behind the line you know being fought with infantry battalions is you know sort of, in a way it does um, does the machine gun down as a specialized weapon by 44 45 definitely you know it, it's only in certain battalions that that's happening so like the air landing and the parachute battalions which are having reduced training um, but you you hit you know, true peak when you've got the pepper pots um, of the late 44 period and early 45, where you've got MMGs working alongside all the artillery, the mortars and everything like that, reaching out to three to four and a half thousand yards um, where the guys sat behind them haven't got a clue what they're hitting. But in a way, it doesn't matter because mm. they know it's hitting the right area on the map. I, so, I cannot think of a movie that shows machine guns in an indirect role at all no it's mm. i mean movie screens generally everything has to be brought into the screen to make yep. it make sense. so everything is happening very close grenades are only hit, you know, grenades kill per, what person a and person b is five feet away and the movie doesn't get hit by grenade fragments but of course in reality you know, they can go <laughs> a lot further so i think i've never seen it i'm just trying to think i've never seen a movie no. that shows machine gun fire and indirect fire at all and we had a question earlier about just if you want to briefly, one of you, all of you, explain exactly in case anyone here doesn't understand what is indirect fire. Um, a target that you can't see, um, an obscured target, be it by fog, nighttime, a hill, um, you know, smoke, or whatever. It's a target you can't see. Right. And so, um, Nick, you've been busting and sitting there. Number one myth about MG40. I fear you've got to give us about 17 of these or more. Yeah, I was going to say, is there just one or is there yeah, like I'm 10? I might go and have a cup of tea now. And um, <laughs> let's, we'll, all, we'll all fuck off. And then we'll come back in half. No, num we'll do, I'll let you have two. Have two, have two myths. Get <laughs> them out of the way. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, actually, Paul, I think everyone should go and make a cup of tea now. Um, I, th I think, yeah, clearly it has to be rate of fire. Yeah. And the perception of um, theoretical, the, the key difference between th 
theoretical rate of fire and actual rate of fire. And if people understood that the German training of their machine, machine gunners, they refer to it as the art of the machine gun. So culturally, that gives an understanding of how they viewed the use of a machine gun, the art of the machine gun. And they, their gunners were trained to fire the MG34, and it was no different to the MG42, between three to eight rounds, three to eight round bursts, three, five, eight rounds. Wow. So, and they, from a marksman perspective, they were then asked to fire between one and three rounds. So if anyone has fired an MG42, they will understand how tricky that is, to, to, to yeah. the, the lightest of feather touches to do so. So if we bear in mind that fire discipline and um, was absolutely uppermost in the mind of, of the German machine gunner. And the reason behind that, if I can illustrate, is a typical... Well, I, I've not seen the change in any manuals up till 40, 1943. The light machine gun section, uh, the light machine gun team in, in, in a grouper were allocated 1,150 rounds. Now, the theoretical rate of fire for a 42 is 1,500 rate, uh, um, uh, rounds per minute. So if you calculate 25 rounds a second, which is what that would equate as, then add in barrel changes, that means the German light machine gun of any section would be out of bullets within 96 seconds. So that means that the German army starts to, to, to fail within two minutes of it opening up a firefight if they were to be recklessly and indiscriminately firing their MG34 or MG42. So we have to understand that, um, has, that it was between 120 rounds per minute was the recommended rate of fire for the MG34 and between 150 and 180 rounds per minute for the MG42. So people may ask, why develop a 1500 round or a 1200, um, a 900 round machine gun in the 34 when it's only going to fire either 120 or 150 rounds per minute? And the reason is we come back to what Morowitz spoke initially. It's about putting down the most amount of rounds in the quickest amount of time. But we have to understand that we have fire discipline and that is absolutely critical. So an MG34 and MG42 team has to husband their, their ammunition. And the Gruppenführer, the section leader, one of his prime requirements was to ensure that his MG team held back a reserve of 250 rounds. Now, one would expect combat experience to, to, to change that in the sense that I'm sure they carried more ammunition. But the premise absolutely remained the same. An MG gunner of a 34 or a 42 fired short bursts, and that was to mitigate the barrel heat to prevent the next mythological element, which is the melting of barrels that we hear about. And when we hear about this, particularly we hear about it in the context of, of Omaha Beach, I don't think I've really ever come across a, um, a, an account of a melting um, MG42 barrel outside of Omaha. And if we look at that, we can probably look at two or three cases, two or three accounts, um, both from 352 Infantry Division, where they have referred to barrels becoming so hot that uh, they were they were unable to be used any further. And I think it's quite simple to understand why that's the case. It's because they were in a unique situation where they had nowhere to go. They were in a fixed, fortified position. They were well equipped with ammunition. You know, if you believe the accounts, between eight to 12,000 rounds, both these guns. And eventually, with, with a limited amount of spare barrels, you're going to get um, barrels melting when it comes to pouring that amount of ammunition onto the beaches of the, uh, the unfortunate American infantry that are attacking that beach. So I think we have to look at the melting barrel um, myth as being a unique situation, and that was D-Day and Omaha Beach. Um, 
I think yeah, that's, that's, point. that's about it. About, that's a yeah. really good point. Yeah, yeah. I was doing some Googling today for stuff and everything you, I was searching MG42, Normandy, MG4, everything comes up to Omar, everything comes to Heinz Severlo, Franz Garkel, all those guys there. And, and we, it seems that we are judging the use of the MG42 over a 76 day campaign in Normandy and a nine, uh, 11 month campaign in the ETO on one day and about three guys, which seems really um, silly when, you, when you're actually facing it now to base it on, uh, and possibly one of those guys being a little bit of a, not a liar, but I think Hein Sevelo's account can be questioned for accuracy. Yeah. Yeah, well, Franz Gockel's account, I think, is pretty good, but Hein Sevelo's goes all over the place, I think, at various times. So we're basing it on one guy who may or may not be an incredibly uh, accurate eyewitness. Um, so if, I could just, if I could just interject, just yeah, to sure. add something to that, um, the modern day Bible of the MG34, MG42 is um, by a Norwegian chap called Folke Mervang. Mm -hmm. And Folke, who has written uh, an absolutely unsurpassed book on these weapons, um, he, when uh, during his research, he looked at numerous um, intelligence reports from various nations, um, uh, enemy nations to Germany, and of all the reports that he looked at, he claims that not one said that they came across an unserviceable barrel when they captured an MG42. So that's just um, a piece of research that Volker Mervang undertook. And, um, and that would tie in if you understand that the German machine gunner was trained to be disciplined in the firing of his weapon. Thank yeah, you. no, good stuff. Um, so who, who's going to throw in a ne another myth? Anyone now? We'll, we'll make it open open forum now. Well, to, to go along with, with the MG42, um, you know, obviously there 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 is this, uh, and Paul, you and I talked about it a little bit uh, yesterday, um, where you have... Uh, the, the rate of fire, everybody's talking about, oh, the rate of fire, the MG42 is so high, and it's this terrified everybody. And um, I've talked to a lot of German vets where they were just as terrified as, of, of the Brownings uh, as, as we were of the MG42. Um, the, but I, I will say, though, that the MG42, when I go to the range and I bring a 1919 or a 1917, um, some of my friends have MG42s and MG34s. Uh, when we start firing the Brownings, you know, first everybody hears automatic gunfire, and then they kind of, you know, look up and they see, oh, well, somebody's got a machine gun. And, and but I tell you what, when, when that MG42 gets put on the Lafette tripod, and 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 we start ripping rounds out of that thing, everybody's heads turning, and and everybody just has this look. And everybody's with their camera, and this thing's firing, and it and it it is almost like a psychological uh, a deterrent because it just sounds so much nastier. Uh, because you can almost you, you don't really hear that iteration in between rounds, um, whereas with a 1919 or a 1917, um, you know, or a Vickers, you, you hear the pop 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 pop. You can almost hear the round, but when you just hear this, you know, going out. Um, it's just, it, it's really terrifying. Um, but again, it, that, it's not taking away from, from again, like what we talked about where the, the, the Germans, uh, we, we have an air show, that's a very uh, large uh, air show here in uh, the World War II uh, air show uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, unfortunately, canceled this year, uh, just like many of other things. Um, but uh, that was a lot of times where I got to meet German vets and, and um, you know, they, they said that, when American uh, machine guns were firing at them, uh, they, they were just as terrified because they knew they were trained machine gunners um, and that, that fire going down range at them. Uh, you know, we always jokingly say, I don't think that uh, anybody in their right mind is going to pick their head up from cover and go, oh, that's only firing 550 pounds a minute. Ah, let's go get them. Um, you, know, <laughs> you, you, you talk to uh, anybody that's uh, not only been in combat in World War II, been in combat in general. Uh, when you have a machine gun firing at you, I don't care what rate of speed, 
uh, you're, you're going to be terrified. And, and a lot of people, people are terrified, but it, it, there is something about that MG42 though, that I, that I will say just from hearing it in a range, live firing it, um, I, I can imagine uh, where GIs were shocked. And, and, and America actually went and invested uh, in a film bulletin. I believe it was for 181, where it was the M42, the bark is worse than its bite. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I agree with that title, um, but uh, we were going through and actually trying to show film to new recruits prior to D-Day saying, hey, look, this isn't that bad because you guys are trained and um, uh, you'll be able to, to take this uh, German machine gun out. Uh, how, and, you know, for, for the most part, I think it is. The it, psychological it, aspect, I think, is fascinating. I mean, yeah, we talked about it the other day, Brian, and that we've got so many accounts of British guy, and American guys and Canadians saying, oh, the Tiger was terrifying, the, the, the Nebelwerfers are terrifying, the Momi Minis, the, uh, the MG42. And we don't have many accounts of Germans saying, oh, my God, the Bren was terrifying or the, the Vickers or the Bren carrier or the whatever it was. So, I mean, I was just from my point of view doing documentaries. I was downloading sound, of, sound effects last year. And when you down, I, to find an MG42 sound effect, mostly you download it and it's a burst of about 40 rounds east. When you download a Browning or Bren, you download a burst of three. It's interesting that even the sound effects. Yeah. You can download are playing along with this idea that you always fire millions of rounds at an MG42, and and I had to cut down the MG42 and to use it in a in a thing, uh, but yeah, Bren, you just get a <laughs> or, 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 or. so, and we were asked to do sound effects at the beginning, right at the beginning. So I said, I go do sound effects, and I've done a couple of sound effects there. So I think <laughs> even within the sound effects libraries, we're playing into this idea the MG42 is all the time, and the movies have influenced that clearly as well. And, so what, uh, I, I suppose what I would just say there is that that is probably around 25 odd plus rounds that would have been fired. It's I, I, from a logical perspective, it just just does not ring true. And I would. It's interesting that Brian brought up the the, the American um, uh, film that that I was only looking at again recently, and. If you go from the German manuals and how they were trained, supposedly trained up until, I say my manuals go up to 1943, and there's no reason for me to think that they would have changed us from three to eight round bursts to 25 to 50 round bursts. That, that just did not happen. Um, I believe that that film is one of the reasons why the mythology of the MG42 has come to be what it is. And that those American servicemen firing that MG34 and that MG42 are not firing them in the way that a German gunner would be trained. I've sat there and sadly timed the, the, the amount of bursts and calculated the amount of rounds they would have fired. And it is not a three to five to eight round burst. And so I would suggest that perhaps that film has been part, has created part of the mythology of the MG42 in these long bursts and that was for a reason as brian suggested it was to turn around and potentially show it as a weakness it's going to either run out of ammunition quickly or it's going to overheat quickly um but clearly you, you were, one would say that that just that just did not happen because the German army was still using that MG42 and producing almost 423,000 of them until the end of the war. And that mythology, I think, is also reinforced by something that, that Jonathan Ware um, on Twitter talks about often, Paul, and that is feedback loops. I think that if you have one historian that writes perhaps either incorrect or flawed interpretations of the MG42, I don't believe that there's there's been many following historians that have actually undertaken their own research to verify or reconcile that information and i think they just followed on and so that's why we've ended up with with this pretty much you know this 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 wonderful tale about what the mg42 um is and the reality 
Yeah, no, definitely. And I think we've hey, got Nick, are you from... are you telling me, Nick, that that <laughs> propaganda film didn't have correct information? <laughs> uh, it, it's when I'm sitting. I, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, Brian. I'm just so sad, and I just sit there and I was calculating the length of first the amount of rounds, and then reconciling it back. So that's the type of sad individual. Yeah. I, <laughs> I think we've all we've all done something where it's eleven o'clock on a Friday night, and we're having a beer, and we're going. This is, this is what we resulted to, to, to doing. Virtually by the time I took <laughs> my footage and tried to convert it into, to, uh, with tonal, uh, looking at pantones and tones, try and work out what color Blanco was on a guy's web. <laughs> And I, I spent like a day doing this. I'd, 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 I'd like to ask you. Come to any conclusions? Like, no, I'm still, I'm still none the wiser. I just was trying to work out if you could identify from black and white webbing the colour of the webbing with Blanco. <laughs> and there was no conclusion. But I think, that, you know, we're, can, we're coming can, up Can I just ask one of, can I, sorry, sorry, Paul, to interject. Can I just ask one of Richard um, on the brain gun? Can I ask Richard, um, was he able to ascertain whether the Bren gun barrel um, has a life of 250,000 rounds? <laughs> Uh, I knew you were going to ask that. It was going to be one of my next myths. So I'll answer that one in a minute because I don't want people to forget burst length just for a minute. Right. So okay. what was the burst Cheers. length for the MG? People. Burst length. Burst length. <laughs> I feel like Sesame Street now. B <laughs> <laughs> I have a book behind me. Burst length. Today's word is burst Burst. <laughs> First length on the MG42 was, what did you say? Five to eight? Three, three between three to five to eight rounds. Yeah, okay. So the first length on the Vickers is 25 rounds. Right. Can you imagine, so you can, you can imagine the sort of, you know, that we're getting the same number of rounds on target. We're just going to take a little bit, we're going to do it slow and steady, whereas the MG42 is rushing at it. And mm. we can do that for as long as you like. And that's sort of the sustainability of the, of the, of, of the Vickers. Um, the Bren barrel is a great question. Interesting. So I think it would be a very, very, very loose piece of pipe after 250 rounds. Um, 250,000 rounds. 250,000 rounds. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I forgot the thousand because it's so incredulous. Um, <laughs> uh, estimate uh, between 15 and 20 in reality. Um, and, that, and that compares to 4,000 to 7,000 rounds for the MG42, as we okay. spoke about the other day. Yeah, and about 18,000 rounds on the Vickers. Um, and that all depends on your know, rate of fire. You know, Brian showed up the different thicknesses of the barrels between a water-cooled and an air-cooled machine gun there. You know, the, the Vickers is the same. It's quite a barrel, it's quite a slow, um, it's quite a small barrel inside that dirty great water jacket. You just need to add loads of metal if you want to fire it air-cooled. Like the K-gun barrels are a good substantive barrel, about the same as the Bren. But the Bren is not going to last, um, you know, yeah, anywhere, anywhere near... You know, that number of that number of rounds whatsoever. We should bring Brian if he's got any comments about American barrel. Yeah, barrel uh, life. Barrel life. Anything you know? Yeah, I don't. Um, not off the top of my head, I can't recall um, the, the 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 barrel life. Um, obviously, you know, for for um, in terms of warping and dimensions, uh, you know, you're probably going to see a lot more issues of sustained fire uh, with that uh, with the 1919. Um, but again, it's it's a lot easier um, uh, to change these barrels out yeah. um, and now, not relative to an MG42. Uh, the big thing with uh, with American uh, uh, machine guns, light machine guns, and the heavy machine guns um, is uh, the the barrel changes and the head spacing. Uh, whereas um, for 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 me, for for somebody to to, to change uh, a barrel, uh, everything's got to come out the back end. All the guts, the bolt, the barrel extension, the lock, everything's got to come out. And then that's where you see these uh, these threads here. And then this gets screwed into that barrel extension. And um, the head spacing needs to get set. Um, whereas with an MG42, uh, you know, Nick uh, can attest to, uh, to, to change out an MG42 barrel, uh, there's a pedal on the side of the gun. You slap out, barrel comes out, new barrel gets in, slaps back in. And it's uh, already head spaced and uh, ready to fire when you're back up and running. Uh, where you're you're talking about seconds, or with Browning, uh, you're talking minutes, uh, uh, and and that could seem like eternity uh, in combat. Um, but in terms of uh, lifespan, um, I, I can't recall uh, the numbers uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, they, they were quite a few for the 1919. The, the barrels were pretty heavy duty. I'm still shooting 
you won't stock uh, barrels there. Yeah. And you, uh, uh, during the war, probably throughout the war, uh, probably got sent over to Israel. Uh, was there sent, you know, you know, sent back uh, I, I, I have barrels that I, and that I fired uh, 10,000, 15,000 rounds out of and I'm still using them. Uh, and they have good rifling on them. So the, the barrels were, were quality barrels uh, for, for the 1994. So I think I'm going to try and go back and look at some of the questions we got because I think we need to start thinking about. Um, I'll, I'll need to have a shave soon and go to you know, <laughs> feed the cats. Um, but um, just some of the questions we had. Someone asked about, and this is for Brian really, about the use of the M2 machine gun in the infantry support role, um, the 50 cal, I guess. So um, what? I mean, we can touch on it briefly. Yeah. So so that's going to be. That's going to be used at a, at a, at a battalion level. Um, they're talking about, uh, I know Rich was, was talking a little bit about um, the, the uh, anti-aircraft, uh, well, there was anti-aircraft mounts early on for, for the Vickers. Uh, it was kind of the same with, with 1919. Um, if you look at some of the early manuals, they actually show where, um, how to set the 1919 tripod up and you would get this leg uh, position up with your assistant gunner to fire up an aircraft, um, but uh, the 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 uh, 50 cal uh, was uh, again at a, at a battalion level uh, to use the almost in a support role uh, like the 81 millimeter orders uh, were, and um, I'm not too well versed on on how the the squads of the M2 uh, were. It's one gun that's a little bit out of my uh, price range, so I only, I only <laughs> stick with what I uh, with wow the, uh, the ammunition that's out of the price range. I'll, I'll yeah. quote that to, uh, your, to Carolyn for you there. That it's ex so that well, I can quote that back. So it's out of your price range. So um, <laughs> yeah, another question we had, and, it, and I'm going I'm to add another question to it, and it was about can a it's a rich, I guess, adding a sniper scope to the Bremen gun. We had a question from Martin. Has that ever been? Yeah. Well. Right, so I'll use Johnny P's uh, brand gun, and I know he's watching. So, um, hello, John. <laughs> um, dovetail will fit a dovetail, and you do see some with a number thirty-two scope on. Um, you uh, you can't do that in the field; it won't match. You know, you can't use it as a sniper rifle. Why would you? You've got the M fields that are made to fire single shot. Um, you do see, I've even seen number 32 scopes, you know, match to the dovetail on a Vickers. It seems that those photos exist and possibly were used for, I don't know, zeroing or something like that. I've never really got to the bottom of it, but that does seem to be sort of FUD law of, um, you know, do you want to use it in a direct fire role? Why would you put a delicate instrument like a 32 scope onto a Bren? Don't get it. Which brings me to the use in Siege at Jadaville, where they use a Bren. I, I still can't wrap my head about the logic behind that. Although I read the book and it, it did, apparently it did happen. Yeah. But I, can't, I can't come up with a, a reason myself why you'd use a Bren that you wouldn't just use a number four for. So I, I, the only thing I can think is you've got a really good marksman on the Bren. Um, and it's a you know it gives you almost a it gives you a semi-automatic capability, whereas yeah, with the body, you know, so you haven't got to you know take your eye off the target. Um, a bit like when you get semi-auto, you know, sniper rifles being developed, it means that the you know the the, the weapon remains much more stable um, without you having to bot you know cock the bolt. But I guess so. Yeah, if you're taking yeah. out multiple, so I don't know. Yeah, no, it's bizarre stuff. Um, any other myths you want to bust? Does anyone else want to correct anything? Saying one thing about their research that to, to people are watching. There are still people here. And I'm, so, I'm surprised <laughs> they may have gone off and come back. I don't know, but uh, there are still people watching. Um, and people are saying it's been very informative. But they're mostly yeah. our friends, Rich. I mean, it's <laughs> been online, but, uh, Wolf yeah, Wolf has sent me a lovely note. And, and, um, but yeah, there are people watching. Um, any other myths to bust? Can I get the sustainability one across? Yes, so, that. you know, su sustainment on the Vickers or sustainability. So the whole million rounds thing is one that does get talked about. It's clearly a First World War example. But picking up on your point about, you know, all the MG42 myths come from D-Day. All the Vickers MG myths come from, like, Highwood in 1916. And, you know, sadly, one myth, one guy... You know, is the source of that, a guy called Hutchison. We wrote a paper for an academic journal. It was got published like 18 months to two years ago. But, you know, that had been used by Richard Holmes, Gary Sheffield, other, other you know, quite preeminent authors that used, you know, this veteran 
um, these veteran accounts and you know, this one veteran's account permeates through. So you know, it, it technically could fire a million rounds um, in 12 hours or 10 guns could. Uh, it didn't. You know, the numbers are wrong. Um, you need a lot of water. You need a lot of a massive pile of ammunition, much more than your 12,000 rounds um, in you know, the, the size of a million round stockpile of ammunition. Uh, it's crazy. It takes a week to load the ammunition belts and you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, it, it, this myth about the Vickers and firing you know, these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousand rounds often come down to a Vickers machine gun company fired that amount. You know, mm. 12 guns, not or a battalion fired, not one gun. And I think that's the whole, you know, there's not one gun that saves the day in any of these myths, any of this stuff really at all. There's never a hero gun like there is in the films. Brian, have you got any, anything else you'd like to dispel? You're, you're the American expert on American round. You fire most of these stuff, whereas some of us over here, with Richard done some firing, Nick, but you've yeah. done a lot of firing of weapons. So um, any other myths you want to dispel about machine guns or, or, or other weapons if you want to, but we'll stick to machine guns, I think. The, I'm the token American gun nut. Yeah, well, it's, 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 yeah. There's a few more of you over there, though. Yeah. Aren't there? Let's not get into gun nuts and who whose country has the most of them because we know who wins that one. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I've uh, I think um, it's two two quick myths. Uh, you know, and again, when we talk about these myths, it's only really in between this small circle of, of history nerds that we're arguing and you know feuding over. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes we think it's like this big uh, international debate when in actuality it's just like 12 of us uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a Facebook uh, chat going, well, I believe, uh, you know, this was developed for this or, or that, but um, uh, the BAR, the BAR usually gets a, a, a distinction of this uh, workhorse uh, uh, gun and, and a reliable gun, and overall it was, it, it, re it really was a reliable gun. Um, but um, it did, uh, you know, it did have its uh, fair share of, of um, uh, issues. Um, you know, one of them being when uh, the, the gun was cleaned, you couldn't you couldn't clean the gun straight up and down uh, because any type of fluid that would go in would actually go into uh, could seep into the actuation uh, mechanism in the stock and gunk it up. Um, and um, when the 1918A2 uh, was developed again, the, the original M1918 uh, had a fully automatic, semi-automatic, and safe. Those, those were those were the, uh, the variations. Uh, the 1918A2 uh, took away the semi-automatic uh, firing capability and um, I had a fast fire, a fast automatic fire, a slow automatic fire. Um, and um, what would happen is, is that when you were cleaning it, we are finding out early on, uh, is when you were cleaning it, that, that if a cleaning solution or water or anything got down into into that that, that buffer, um, it would uh, screw up to, to the fact that really they can only fire in a fast uh, automatic. And um, I, I talked to, to a few guys that, that, that ran BARs, and I said, well, did you actually use uh, that uh, that that capability? And a lot of them said no. We just put it on the fastest, and, and we threw rounds down range. Um, and again, you see a lot of um, you know, guys that, that have BARs here in America, or reenactments or living histories. But when you go and look at photos too, um, the, the 1918A2 really, they, the guys stripped everything off of them and, and almost went back to the original design uh, because it was just too much weight. And um, so if you look at a lot of pictures um, uh, later in the Normandy campaign and then later in the war, uh, especially when we're getting into uh, uh, Germany, Aachen, uh, those battles, battle of um, you know, the flash hiders off, there's no problem. Uh, they're stripping these things down. Um, so, so it did, it did add its setbacks, but I mean, on, on overall, uh, I mean, it, it was a, as a, a reliable, but it wasn't without its, its uh, uh, faults. And then also to barrel changing on it. Um, you know, for, for something uh, uh, like a, a Vickers or an MG42, the barrel change is, is fairly uh, simple. The, the, the 1919s and the 1920s are simple. And, um, but, but the, the BAR 
uh, once that barrel was shot, you know, you needed an armor uh, or somebody with qualified tools uh, to remove that barrel from the receiver, put, put a new barrel on, uh, and do some type of ordinance uh, a replacement with it. Uh, so, so it did have its drawbacks. And then the second thing is, is a lot of people talk about in, in, in these nerdy debates uh, are uh, belts and links. Um, uh, you know, towards people had this conception that we're using cloth belts. And then, uh, you know, towards the end of the war, we start using links. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the links. The, the development for 30 links for the Browning is actually started back in World War One. Um, so uh, we're, we're already developing. So, so and part of the issue is is the belts. Um, the belts once you move the machine, the machine puts the, the puts the, the, into the belts. Uh, but the problem is, is that once they get outside of, of the can, the ammo can. Um, here's another one of my my props here. Every American has, you know, brownie belts just laying around. So I'm sure Rich has Vickers belts and things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, these were actually back um, in the 50s. Um, but you see this Saving Private Ryan. It's, it, I think it's a good representation um, of the downside of, of these belts. So when they're pressed into the belts, it's a friction fit. And um, so when guys are, are putting them around their neck and they're moving with them, these rounds are actually sliding out. They're not lined up perfectly. They're missing. So when you're firing and you get to an empty cell in that belt, it you know you have to keep racking that to get the next round up. Um, it, towards uh, the towards the end of the war, we actually produced uh, upwards of around two billion links, and they're mainly used for uh, the the armor, uh, tank tree link, and um, uh, for air force. Uh, those are really the main consumers of, of links for 30 cal ammunition. It's not until February of 1945 uh, where the Ordnance Department says, hey, we should probably be using these links for everything because by this time they got the zinc coating down right. They're going to knock out rust as much. Um, links actually provide a, a solid, um, a, a uniform um, distance across. Across the, the the belt um, uh, that allows for uh, sustained uh, fire firing uh, without trying to miss one out, and you can maneuver with the links a lot more without worrying about them coming out just because of the way the press fitted in. Um, but it's not until February that they authorize it, and at that stage, you know, the war is pretty much on, on, on you know, is at least winding down in the European theater. Um, so, well, talking of things winding down, I think we ought to start winding down. So, see what I did there. Um, <laughs> I was actually commenting. I think it might be a quite a nice way to start bringing things to an end. And this, he says, um, question for all, rather than the usual argument of which was the best, would it be fair to say that each nation had machine guns that were fit for their intended purpose by 1944-45? How profound. Yeah. Is unlike John there, isn't there? He's <laughs> very profound. I like his comments. On, um, he's Welsh. They're very deep, aren't they? <laughs> I, I think that makes sense. I think... Yeah. I think um, that, that's my view. I also think going back to my top track, if you've, if you've learned one thing, that this is you can't, you just can't compare <laughs> against machine gun. You have to pair, compare their use, the way their bit, the, their, their, the section works around it, and and the way the army has set up to use the uh, the machine guns within its doctrine. So, um, do we agree with that statement that all of our machine, everyone's machine gun is kind of doing the job it's supposed to be doing? Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I mean. For, for me, Paul, and um, it's 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 a fool's exercise comparing MGs such as 42s to Brens to to BARs. You know, it's they were undoubtedly designed for the use of their the belligerent at the time, and that was also influencing their tactics and. It's it, uh, if you do start comparing, it's it's apples and pears, and you need to start looking at them with their own unique strengths and weaknesses. And um, yeah, I, I, I very much agree with you. Yeah, I, th I think that there are strengths. I mean, when you're talking about the BAR there, Brian, I kept thinking about in my reenactment days, 
it's always to put the bipod on or not to have the bipod on because whichever you have, it's a pain in the ass. You know, if you've got the bipod on, it's too heavy to fire from the hip, from the from the shoulder. But if you don't have the bipod on, when you're going down to ground, it's getting the magazine out from underneath because you have to lift it up to get magazine. Whereas the bipod helps keep it off the ground. So whatever I was doing with it, I always wish it was the other way around. I either wish the bipod was on when I don't have it on. And if it could just go on and on with a clip, that'd be brilliant. If, 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 the, if the BAR bipod was as simple to put on as the Bren barrel change, it'd have been awesome. The Bren's weaknesses were magazines, like with Sten magazines, weren't they, Rich, I think? Yeah. Is that fair to say? Uh, magazines? Magazines in general, I think for any weapon you know that you get that's magazine-fed is going to be a problem. Um, if the weapon's so good and the only sort of fail point is the mag, everybody's going to whinge about the mags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, also, too, I, 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 you know, I touched on this a little bit, and I, and I, I this is kind of my, my final thought. Where I, uh, I, I look at it here, where we're talking about these different nations and, and, and these guns, and, and I look at it at least from an American side, uh, where you know currently we feel. Uh, two belt-fed machine guns, the 249 variant and the M240. The M249 fires a 5.56 cartridge, and the M240 style fires a 7.62. And and I and I look at those machine guns uh, that that we're currently using um, in the American military, and I can't uh, say to myself, and I look at them and say. It, it has the capability of, of a, it's kind of like a, a hybrid of a, of a BAR and a 1919 in a lightweight package that has that belt fed capability. It has the MP42 feed system on it because if you look at an M240 um, and you, you show those feed systems, I mean, the terms right running out of the gate uh, with how those feed systems work. Um, we, we did it on the M60, on the M249 and the M240. And, and it, so it has that capability as well. And then also to the barrel changes on the M249 and the M240 are very similar to how Bren guns uh, are, 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 are changed. So it's unique, at least from an American sense where we're talking about these weapons and, and, it, and it's kind of taken the best of, of all of these weapons at least from, from our sense that you, know, you can see these similarities and that lineage of, of weapons now that we're saying, okay, we're gonna take the best of this, the best of that, and kind of meld it together. And, uh, at least for, for, for our crew serve uh, or our squad as uh, weapons. Um, you Something know, we, you have to fa thank the Belgians for. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Belgians, yeah. 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 I'm mm -hmm. saying more of our of our usage. Yeah, I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, yeah, we're we're and again that, that's the problem with some of these sometimes, you know, you're you're talking in a sense, and usually when I give these talks, I'm giving them at a, at a real high level, and you only have maybe one or two people. Uh, um, you know, they, they go, well, you know, so yeah, I, I try, to, try to keep it high level because, again, you don't want to start a, a Twitter or a Facebook uh, war over uh, two words that were said or misspoke. <laughs> oh, I mean, pe people are still, we said we haven't covered the Soviet weapons. We never said we were going to cover, cover Soviet weapons. Um, we will do that in another show we <laughs> Soviet experts on. Um, people are saying we're, we're teaching them stuff. Is uh, They must have nothing else to do on a Sunday evening. Wow. Blame it on Corona. Um, uh, <laughs> it's two and two and a quarter hours now. Um, which were, there was something I'm sure you said in our pre in our practice that was really pertinent that we haven't done, but I now can't remember what it was. But is there anything any kind of closing remarks you want to make? It was something about the. Was it that when we your your thing, the modern? Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I can bore everybody with capability just, just, analysis. So uh, the whole the apples version. versus pears. Yeah. So the quick version is tepid oil. Anybody that's ever studied at Staff College or the Defence Academy will know tepid oil. Capability management in the Army now looks, or in the Ministry of Defence, looks at the whole capability. So you've got training, equipment, uh, personnel, information, uh, infrastructure, doctrine and concepts, um, organisation, uh, in information and logistics, and then the interoperability that works around the net. So what we always focus on about machine gun chat is equipment, the tech. We always look at that. We then sometimes get strayed into logistics because we talk about supply because tech on its own doesn't answer all the questions for us. And we think we can get everybody better because the, the, you know, the allies have better logistics. So they think they win that top Trump argument. But until you start to look at it from a capability level, 
you know, capability and you can't compare, compare things. So when, you know, you, you, sort of the summary comes that everybody has the best fit for what they want. Well, yeah, because they've spent years working it out. And actually, if you change one thing in that, um, you know, tepid oil, uh, those d defense lines of development, all the others have knock on effects. So if you suddenly decide to change the Vickers as the media machine gun to the ZGB, all your training changes, all your logistics changes, the infrastructure you need changes. The Germans perhaps have some of these top trumps win, uh, winning because they're using the MG42 in that light and that heavy role. So training sorted, logistics is, uh, are a little bit different because you've got them going to different places, but infrastructure is the same. It's being made in the same factories. All you've got to do is bring a Lafette factory online you know, and some optics mm -hmm. stuff to bring it in. You don't need to change it out. You know, minus point for the Brits on that because we're using a different ammunition. So our logistics become difficult. So, you know, until you start to look at things across the board, across all of those different lines of development and look at capability, not just technology, uh, to help define what we're looking for. And all of these countries have different understandings uh, of their machine gun capability. And that's really important to before you start getting apples and pears arguments that we just yeah. get bogged down in. But I think, you know, we, you know we, we, we've all enjoyed discussions on Facebook and Twitter and, you know, 160 characters, whoever it is, you can't, you can't possibly, even in a long, even in one of Jonathan Ware's long threads, you still can't <laughs> get anywhere near, and I'm meaning that in a complimentary way, yeah, to yeah. understand the nuance of machine gun use in 90. We, 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 we could keep going for two hours on this, I think. Um, and we we haven't we, we we still could go you know we, we haven't concluded everything. What we've what we've done has been very interesting. We said that comparing them at, at, on the top trumps level is just pointless, and saying this one's better than that is just utter, utterly utterly nonsensical. Um, we've we've bust a few myths, which I think is good. I think people learned a bit about machine guns. I've certainly learned about the American stuff from Brian. I'm yeah. I'm the least hot on really from the German side from Nick. And um, Nick, I think you've lived up to your mantle of being the MG42 geek, which is an award you may or may not want to have but it, Rich, i knew you knew your stuff because you've bought me in foxholes with it over in the past um so this has been good stuff and i think you know we could we could go off on tangents and things and but i think we should definitely come back and do rifles and and and, and pistols and as well and then and bust all those the, the m1 ping the m1 clip ping and the bolt on the m on the k98 sounding like a cricket and all that those bullshit. Were true i thought those were true those were true bits. <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's you learn that lesson one at reenactor camp don't you yeah you learn, you learn and the that. sten gun ones will trump like the mg42 ones will in bouncing those sten guns yeah yeah, yeah. Anyone, everyone knows a story of a bouncing sten gun. no one's ever witnessed it though have they? it's like it's like bigfoot <laughs> we will try it one day oh yeah but, i've heard a story about a bouncing yeah. sten gun yeah so we come back to, yeah, I think Nick wants to come in with some pearl. Yes, yeah, I, I just want to um, close off with just two, two, two short points, Paul. One being that in a recent discussion with an ex Bundesbeer, Bricht Schutz, a gunner on the MG3, I was, it made me smile when he said that they fired two to five round bursts and they changed the barrel every 150 rounds. So we're talking about 75 years of training that hasn't really changed in the German army. So um, from the 42 to the MG3, and I thought that was, that was just of interest. And my final um, message to everyone out there um, li listening or viewing is don't believe everything that you read about the MG42. Well, I mean, that's, and that's a very good point to kind of bring things to a halt on. And I think I don't think in many ways we can blame sometimes historians for for um, for not going to the level of geekdom that that you know you guys have because there's only so much time you can spend. If you're writing a book about um, Italy in 1944, you could spend weeks and weeks just learning about tanks. You could spend weeks and weeks learning about mortars, weeks and weeks learning about camouflage, and and you'd never get your book done. So I think. You know what we're doing is we're not we're not saying that historians are wrong. We're saying that sometimes the little short comments they make are are, are worthy of further elaboration and investigation, and that maybe yeah. taking things at face value is not always wise. Um, that's what I'm learning. You know, and we you know I was looking for books. I was looking for Rick Atkinson and James Holland and, and Peter Caddick Adams and Stephen Ambrose and and you know there's only so much time they can spend on machine gun tags we've spent you know now nearly two and a half hours about it, haven't actually got anywhere near an end yet we're still still rambling i mean good rambling. so i think it just it's teaching people don't believe it don't believe sound bites 
the, the yep. top arms argument is, is just bullshit. We've agreed on that. There is no better machine gun or worse machine gun. Actually, they've all got a very similar uh, uh, practical rate of fire and practical use and the comparisons between infantry squads across the three armies is broadly similar. I think we agree on that. Um, and the fact that if the Germans, as I've next point there, but they're still teaching it the same way now, I think it's fascinating. Given mm. the, 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 the fact they lost the war, the fact they must have realized that the, they can't have got the machine gun idea too wrong if they're still using that technique 75 years on. If they lost the war, it wasn't because of incorrect use of machine gun fire. Is that, I think that's something in my head. Pretty now. much. So, um, yeah, well, I think we're going to bring it. We're, we're getting requests. Someone said, some glutton for punishment said something along the lines of, we should do a regular weapons show. So uh, <laughs> I'm game. If you're game, I'm game. Um, oh, yeah. We could, and we could have a, um, have a variety of experts on, because I know my, Brian knows a lot about mortars. Um, um, my weakness. That's my weakness. It's your, your, <laughs> my, my, my weakness, my weakness to get it. No, but, um, no, but right, mortars we could do. We could yeah. do um, uh, armoured cars. We could do tanks. I mean, there's all sorts of things we could do if people want to. But I think if people like the format of, of four idiots rambling on about weapons, you we can certainly do more of this. It's fun. So um, I think uh, at nearly two and a half hours, it's time to say thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for those who've stuck with this. And um, um, we'll, 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 if people want to carry on some comments, because the live chat, once I close yeah. the stream, you can't join in the live chat. But if you want to carry on on the YouTube comments, I, I promise I'll go back there and add some stuff to it. Uh, uh, Rich and Nick are both on, on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Brian, you're not on Twitter, are you? Uh, no, I'm just on uh, the, the bitch you're, you're tempted now, aren't you? Now you, oh, there's weapons <laughs> That's on That's where it happens. Yeah, like, they allow that on there? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, there, there is lots of weapons talk on there, Brian. Uh, so, um, yeah. But um, you can you can make contact with all of us via various means. And we'll, we'll promise to kind of come and uh, address the comments on any of the, the proper comments for the video. And perhaps put a link to that MG42 video we talked about, and, yep. and, and maybe where we've got some of our archives from. People might be interested in some of the sources of this stuff. But um, yep. I'm going to say thank you very much, guys. It's been, I've enjoyed it. I've just been yeah, doing it. I'm up for another one. Thank you. Let's do mortars. So, um, yeah, it's been good. So, um, remember, subscribe, click the uh, subscribe button to get more notifications. Um, I've got nothing actually planned the next few days, except I'm planning. Um, things for beyond that. I want to do something about, something about Mulberry Harbours next week and uh, following the Villa Bocage discussion, I'm actually in, in discussion with Daniel Taylor to go and do a proper documentary, full-blown, go down there and do proper footage with a proper camera because I think we um, we hit on something and the, the technicalities of yesterday made it a bit um, a bit raw, but I think going back and doing a proper documentary about that, I'm planning to do that now. Um, and there's lots of shows coming up. We're going to do a show about Joe Biley, the Jumping, uh, jumping Joe, the parrot. We're going to get one or two of his sons on and get a Russian tank expert talk about his story. Um, I've got other historians lined up, Mark Milner, Mark Zelke, um, uh, John McManus. I'm going to bring him on to do some more stuff about Omaha and Normandy campaign. So thanks for watching World War II TV. If you want to be a patron, we always uh, could do with that. And Rich, Brian, Nick, thank you again. I'm closing the meeting, closing the stream. Good night. Thank you for watching, everybody. Thank you. Thanks all. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Right.